Hello and welcome to three hours of Nest.js tutorials and instruction. This video is made up of six tutorials that build upon each other much like the chapters of a book. Throughout the lessons in this video, I will mention links being available in the description below. I've compiled all of these links into one GitHub resource that you will find in the description. Hi, I'm Dave Gray, and I'm the creator of these Nest.js tutorials. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel for more tutorials like this one. You can also follow me on X, and if you're feeling generous, you can even buy me a cup of coffee. Let's get started learning Nest.js with chapter one. I'm excited to get started with this Nest.js series. So let's start off with a few common questions about Nest.js. And let's be clear, it's Nest.js and not Next.js, two separate things, of course. Now, Nest.js, a question that is frequently asked, is it the same as Node.js? Well, Nest.js is a framework built on top of Node.js. And so that is really the difference, kind of like Next.js is a framework built on top of React. Now, when we talk about frameworks, they're often more opinionated. They have a structured way of doing things. So let's look at this next question. What is Nest.js versus Express.js that we would commonly use with Node.js? Well, Nest follows the MVC design pattern while Express doesn't do that. You can attempt to follow the MVC design pattern with Express, but Express is very unopinionated. And if I jump over to the expressjs.com site, you'll see they define Express as being unopinionated, whereas Nest.js is very structured and is opinionated, not unopinionated. So when we come back here, we get a little bit more detail here, and it says we use components like controllers, providers, and modules. We'll be covering all of those things. So finally, I wanna answer one other question that has, why is Nest.js so popular? And we're looking at Google results for all of these, so you could look these up as well. But it's opinionated, as I said. It's well-structured architecture. It has a definite way that you do things. It has TypeScript support, so we will be using TypeScript right from the very beginning. Scalability, meaning you could, of course, scale this up, make a larger application, and because of that structure, it won't turn into spaghetti, it won't get disorganized, and it has a strong community. So you can look up a lot of things about Nest.js on the web already. Let's go to the Nest.js documentation, and here we can see, I have it highlighted, under the hood, Nest makes use of robust HTTP server frameworks like Express. And Express is the default. So not only is Node under the hood, but so is Express. And that brings me to prerequisites. You're going to understand much more of this Nest.js series and the benefits that Nest.js provides if you're already familiar with working with Node.js and Express. And I have a course for that on my YouTube channel, Node.js for Beginners, where you'll learn both of those. Also, Nest.js has TypeScript built in, so we'll be using TypeScript right from the start here. And besides that, uh, if you're not familiar with TypeScript, of course, I have a course for that on my channel as well. Besides that, there will be a lot of OOP, which is object-oriented programming. It's not all OOP. It does say Nest has some FP, which is functional programming, or FRP, which is functional reactive programming. But much of what you're going to see is OOP, and that is creating classes, extending classes, adding methods, calling methods, things like that. So if you're also familiar with JavaScript classes, it will help maybe go back and brush up on those. So I could say this is Nest.js for beginners, but that doesn't mean absolute coding beginners. That means you should know these prerequisites to get the most out of this series before you dive into learning Nest.js. And our series goal is going to be building a fully functional REST API with Nest.js. So now let's jump into VS Code and get started. Before we get started in VS Code, you do need to have Node.js installed. If you don't, go to Node Node.js.org and install the LTS version that is recommended for most users. That stands for long-term support. So go ahead and download and install that if you don't have it. We can check your version back in VS Code. Okay, I've got VS Code open. I have an empty folder, and that's what you should do is open up an empty folder in VS Code that you're going to create your project in. I'm 
going to press Control and the back tick to open a terminal window. Now, just to verify that you have Node installed or a fairly current version, you can type Node-V and check what version you have. I have 18.18.2. I saw there was a new version there, so I need to install that very soon as well. However, 18.18.2 is well beyond the requirements that we need to work with Nest.js. So that's where I'll start today. Now after that, Nest.js has a very useful command line interface that we want to install for our, our project. First, we'll type npm i, then dash g, then at, nest.js slash cli. This will install the command line interface globally. That's what this dash g does. And you want that so you can just use it anytime you're starting a new nest.js project. So I'm going to press enter. It will begin installing. It could take just a little bit of time. And then when it's finished, we'll come back. Okay, the cli is now installed. So now I can type nest the word new, and then the project name. Now I'm going to type lesson one because I'm going to keep different folders or directories, if you will, for each lesson in this video series. You can name this whatever you want to, maybe Nest REST API, because you'll continue to probably build in that same folder. I'm going to say this is lesson zero one and press enter. Now it's going to ask which I want to use, NPM, Yarn, or PMP. I'll just press enter on NPM and it will begin installing. Again, this will take a little bit and I'll come back when it's complete. Okay, that install has completed and now I wanna open up this lesson one folder and whatever, of course, you named your folder. So I'm going to go to the file directory, choose open folder, and from there, I'm going to choose this Nest series folder I've got. There it is, lesson zero one and select folder. And now we have opened up the new project that we created with the CLI. It was that easy. Lots of files over here. We're going to look in the source directory. And you can see here, the files have the TS extension. We are using TypeScript. Let's look at the main.ts. And you can see it really just starts everything off. Here we are having our app listen on port 3000. This is something, if you're familiar with Node.js and Express already, that part should look kind of familiar right there. Everything else probably looks a little different, but this is the entry point. This is what kicks off your application. So now if we look at the rest of the files here beside the main.ts, we can see an app dot module dot ts. Now this is the main module, the root module for our application. And you can see it specifies imports. It also specifies controllers and providers. And it's already added a controller here. We can look at that. Here's our app dot controller dot ts. Then it has a dot spec dot ts for the controller. This is where we would write tests for that controller if we were doing that. And then there is an app.service.ts. This is what has the provider that is talked about right here, the service. So a service provider, if you will. Now, if we break this down and we look at the controller and we're bringing in app controller from our controller file here, you can see the controller has a route. So this is a git route. And then it has the git hello or here specified as well. So what we do here is at the git route, we have git hello, and then we return the service that calls the method. So you can see how this is broken up. If you've created a REST API before, especially with Node.js and Express, you'd see the controller is more or less handling the route. And then what we have here in the service is the actual method that returns hello world. So in the controller, we're importing the service. And then when we go to the git route, that is when this occurs that calls the service with the method here. And then that method is called. Now, if that doesn't make sense, that's okay. We're going to dive in and create one of these step-by-step -step as we go. Let's look at the package JSON because there's going to be a lot in here, a lot more than you would typically see if you just started a Node.js an express application. And you can see dependencies listed here and then lots of dev dependencies as well. And of course we said we're already using TypeScript and we have lots of types here. Also there's some things from Nest.js including the CLI listed here under dev dependencies. The dependencies themselves, not that large of a list and that's okay. But what we really want here is the start 
and then there's also start dev. We'll be using start dev because notice it has a watch flag. So as we make changes to our files, it will restart our application and of course reflect those changes. So again, start colon dev, and you may not be used to that. You may just be used to seeing dev over here. So now we want to open a terminal window again with control in the back tick. Here we can type npm run start colon dev, and it should start our Nest.js application of course, that has the hello world provided. And here we can see everything logged already to the console as it started. So now let's go ahead and close out of this terminal. And let's go back to our module that we were looking at. And this is the root module for the application. And remember, now when a get request comes in, we can look at the controller. We can see that it handles a get request here. And we're going to have get hello. And this is going to return this get hello method from the app service. And if we look at that method, it should say hello world. So now to do all of this, let's go to my Thunder client. You could do this with Postman or something else if you wanted to. I'm going to clear out this user's message and just do localhost 3000. And now this is a get request. And I don't need a body there or anything, but it won't hurt if I leave it there as well. But this is just going to localhost 3000, as you see right here, and I'm going to send this request. And now it returns hello world. And that's exactly what is expected. So now let's create our own module, something we want to use here besides our basic root module that returns hello world. And of course, we could have it do anything else we want to. Now to do that, we can use that useful nest JS CLI once again. So control in the back tick. Now I'm just going to leave it running here and I'm going to open up another terminal window with the plus symbol. You could do either. You could press control C to close out of the application or exit the application. And you could, of course, do this as well. What I'm going to do now, though, is type nest G and then module. And after that, I need to type a module name. Well, I'm going to make a users module. So I'll just type users and press enter. Now we should see this add a user's directory inside of this source directory here to the application. Remember, this one is our root here that we have app.module. So now let's open this up and I'll close the terminal windows once again. And inside here we see a users.module.ts. Now it doesn't have many of the other things that were inside of this app.module yet, but we'll be able to add those as we need them. One important thing to note that was added to our root module, the app.module.ts, is now in imports where it was previously empty. Now it is importing the user's module. It's creating that relationship. So this would be the parent, if you will. It's the root module. And of course, the user's module does link back to that. Now let's look at the users module again, and we can see we don't have much here. Previously, the other module was specifying things like imports, controllers, and providers here. So let's put controllers, and for now, let's put an empty array. And after that, let's put providers, and for now, let's put an empty array as well. And we won't need to add much more here, except when we provide the controller, when we create one, we'll need to put it in here and import it. And the same for the provider. So now to create our hierarchy here with the provider and the controller, let's go ahead and open the terminal once again. Now I'm going to type nest g controller, and now I'm going to type users to create the user's controller. So we'll press enter and we should see not only the controller created, but it will also create that file for tests. I can close the terminal and click on both of these. Here we have the controller and here is the file that ends in .spec.ts where we would write tests for the controller. Now let's open a terminal once again. I'm also going to type nest g and then service and this will create our provider once again we need to provide a name which again should be users we're creating all of these for our users now that i did that we have two more files i'll close this out and we have the users.service.ts 
And we have the users.service.spec.ts that would have tests once again. So now we see the structure. And now if we look back at our module, without myself even adding those, remember I had empty arrays right here. Now we have both of those imported and they are provided here to the module inside of the brackets that we had previously left empty. So now we have a complete module for our users and we're ready to move on and put in the routing logic in the controller and then eventually the logic for handling each of those routes inside of the provider that will then be injected into the controller. So all of that is coming up and we'll start in on the controller in the next lesson. Now for a quick review, in the previous lesson we installed the Nest.js CLI, and you see that right here under Dev Dependencies as well, and then we used that to create a new Nest.js project. We reviewed the relationships between modules, as we open this up we can see the app right here, app.module, so we reviewed the relationship between the modules and controllers and providers, which we are creating a service with a provider here, so we have our app service and we also have our app.controller right here and we reviewed that relationship overall and when we created these they were automatically added to our module as well and before we finished we used that same CLI to create a user's directory right here that has a user's module and it really does the same thing now when we created our project of course it created this default app module controller and service for us. But now we created each one of these as we went. So we have a user's module first, and when we use that CLI, we followed this pattern. Let me pull this down for us just a little bit here. And so what we did is type nest g module, and then whatever the name is. And then we did the same for controller, as we really created an empty controller file and that name. So for users, of course, we put users there. And before we finished, we also did the same for the provider, but we don't type provider, we type service and the name there. So we did that, and then our users service was created. So we could say users right here, just so I'm not confusing anyone. That's how we create each one of these. Now today, we're focused on the controller and we created the users controller. So let's take a look at the users controller that we have right now, and we can see there's not much in it. And really the same goes for the service we created, but when we look back at the module, they were both added to the module. Let's quickly look at the docs. We're in the Nest.js docs, and we can see here under controllers that controllers are responsible for handling incoming requests and returning responses to the client. And you can see here's the client, here is the HTTP request, and it's going to a controller. Now, a Nest.js application can have more than one controller, and we'll see how those are dedicated to routes in just a moment. But just below, I also want to highlight, it says the controller's purpose is to receive specific requests for the application, and the routing mechanism controls which controller receives the requests. And we'll look at how that works. It says frequently each controller has more than one route, and then different routes can perform different actions. So let's go back and start to work on our user's controller. We are back in VS Code and this is what we get when we create the controller file. So you can see we import controller from nest.js common and then we have controller here with an at symbol. This is a decorator and we will see lots of these in nest.js. This is saying this is going to handle the user's route. So essentially whatever our domain is, and then it would have a slash users, and that's the route this will handle, at least the parent route, because we can put other routes inside of this where the parent here is slash users, and then we might have slash something else as well. So that's what this is doing. And what are decorators? Well, really decorators are essentially functions prefixed with the at symbol and they run automatically when called. So you can just think of this as nest is running a predefined function here. And that's what a good framework does. It abstracts some of this logic so we don't have to write that ourselves. So this is how we start out. And then you can see export class users controller. So inside of here, we need to essentially plan out 
the routes that we want to handle. So we're going to have a slash users and I could put in, I guess, let me put in comment here and close it out here. And then inside I could put in each one of these routes. We're going to have a slash users. After that, we're also going to have a slash users. And then we're going to pass in a param here inside of the URL. So the ID of the user where we want to get one user. Then we're going to have another slash users here. And let me put the HTTP methods because this would be a get request. This would also be a get request. So the read in CRUD, this would be a post where we create a new user. After that, we're also going to have a patch. And I know some of you would also use put as well, but patch because we might just change one thing in the user record and not the entire user. And here, this would be slash users. And then once again, we would say the ID as a param for the user to identify the user that we want to patch. And then delete. Once again, this would be users and ID to identify the user that we want to delete. So now let's go ahead and create the route for each one of these. So we'll start with our get users where we want to return all of the users. And we'll do that first with the git decorator here. So we'll put in git and I'll press tab here. And yes, it automatically imported that at the top when I did that. And then we call that function. Now, once again, I'll put a comment here and this is git for slash users where we will get all of the users. And now I can just remove it from here and we'll just go down our list as we go. So after we call that git decorator, saying this is for the git route, I'm going to call this function that it calls after find all. And here, let's just return an empty array for now. We know this will be an array of users eventually. Now, after this, I'm going to scroll just a little bit. And now we'll have another git deck. Whoa, I didn't go to the right line here. Just a second. And now we'll have another git decorator here. So I'll put git once again. This will be for the git protocol. And then we'll have users and the ID param. So how will we handle this? Well, I'm going to call this function find one, but we need to pass in an ID and we actually need to say up here that this has the ID param as well. So let's put in the string and then we put in a colon ID that represents that param that will be in the URL. So when we put all of this together, we have users here, which indicates slash users. And then we have ID here, which indicates the slash ID for this git route. And then we'll have a find one function. Now it's going to need to identify that param as it comes in. We do that with another decorator and it's the param decorator. So I'll press tab and let's make sure that imported as well. So now we have the param decorator imported at the top also. And inside of this param, then we also need to pass in an ID string. Notice here, it doesn't have the colon like it does inside of the git decorator. We just put in ID as a string. And then after that, we need to give the type, not a comma here though. We'll just say ID, and this is type string that we expect to receive. All params are strings. And from here, we'll return an object that has the ID in for now. And you can see we're not really handling the logic. The logic will be handled inside of our service when we create that, and then we'll inject that into our controller. But we're not doing that right now. We're just creating the routes. So these are the two Git routes. Now let's quickly talk about this though, because what if we had another route? You wouldn't want to put it underneath this because this is a param. So whatever comes after this slash will be read as the ID. So if I wanted another git route here that would follow users, so I would have git, and then inside of this, let's say I wanted to get all of our users that were assigned the role of intern, and I sent that to a route that was intern. So this would be a git route, and it would be slash users slash intern, or I should say maybe interns, because we would want to get all of the interns. Now there's a couple of things to note here. We would also need a function that was not find all, because we've already defined find all, so we would want maybe find all interns, for example, as our function here. And then let's return an array. But this won't work, because it comes after the find one here, where we're passing this ID param. So 
when we go down our waterfall of routes inside of our controller, what's going to happen is we would get to this route right here and it would read anything after the user's slash as the ID. So we could go ahead and run this right now and I could send in the name or possibly nothing and this would return an empty right here instead of having the ID. Let's go ahead and do that so you can just see what I'm talking about. So I've saved this file. We need to control back tick to open the terminal. Then let's go ahead and type npm run start dev and we can check these three routes and we'll see the issue here that we currently have as well. So everything should be running. It looks good down here in the terminal. I'm going to close that. Now I'm using Thunder Client. If you're not familiar with Thunder Client, you can search Visual Studio extensions over here. This is the extensions button right here. And then when we search for Thunder Client, we find that and you can install it in your Visual Studio code. That's what I'm using to test these endpoints. So once you do that, you should see it over here on the left. I've got a little circle and a lightning bolt. That is Thunder Client. Go to localhost 3000 because that's where our application is running. And from there, I'm going to send a query and I'm going to just send it to users slash users here. So this should return an empty array right now when I send this. And that's what we've got. OK, so now I'm going to send to slash one, say a user ID of one. And this should return the object with an ID of one. But what if I went to slash interns? Because we also set up that get route. I'll send that. And now I get an ID of interns because it read anything after that slash with slash interns as the ID value. So we don't want that. If you were going to have another route, you would need to put this before the route that has the ID here. So if I just move the interns route up above it, for example, and now I go ahead and test this, we should get an empty array. And we do. So the order does matter here, just kind of like a waterfall. You think about how the route will be read and what would happen. So if you had a specific static route like users slash interns, that would need to be before a dynamic route that could accept any ID here as a param. So just consider that when you're building your routes. Now, I don't need the find all interns route and I'm going to delete that. But I wanted to give that as an example to show how important the order can be. We are ready for our next route now. So we've created both of our Git routes. We're ready to post the user. So post a new user. And so what I want to do now is start with the post decorator. Once again, I'll press tab and it should import that at the top. So I've got post and this would be a post method that would just go to the user's route. And once we have that, we're going to have a create function. Now, inside of the create function, we're going to need to receive some data to know what to create for the user. And to do that, we're not going to read a param. We're going to read the body of the request because we should be sending that data. So I'm going to press tab here and it should import body at the top as well. And we do now have body imported here also. So now I'll bring this back down and inside the body, we don't need anything. But afterwards, we need to say, essentially what type the body is. And here, I'm just going to say this is a user. So we're sending user data. And right now, I'll just put in not an array, but an empty object. And it will be an object type for now. We'll get more specific about this in the future, but not today as we're just creating the route. So here, I'm just going to return the user. So whatever we send, so let's control S to save. Let's go back to testing this once again. And now we'll switch this to a post request and we won't go to slash interns. It will be just a slash users here. So localhost 3000 slash users. Let's go to the body and you can see in here I've got name, email and role. Let me put my name in here. I had an empty name for now. So this will be the user information of the user we want to create. So let's go ahead and send this. And that's what we got as a response was that same user information back. And we got the 201 created response instead of a 200 like we did with the Git request. So if I come back to Git, send that, you can see 200, OK. But a post request to create a new user is 201 created. That's everything we want. And Nest.js is handling most of that for us. That was fairly easy to create.
And now we need to create the update route, the patch method. I'm going to copy what we have here for find one. And I'm also going to delete the post that we no longer need in our list up here. And now underneath the post, I'm going to paste this in. I'm just going to change a couple of things. So one is we need the patch method here and I need to spell patch correctly. And now I'll press tab just so it imports it at the top. We'll make sure we've got patch. Yes, we do. Okay, after patch, we're passing in an ID again because this needs to be our identify whichever user we need to update. So this is the patch method here in our comment. It still goes to slash users and then slash ID. So we still have a param. Here I'm going to change the name of this to update, all lowercase. And after that, we need to use the param still for the ID, just like we did up here in find one. It is still a string, but we're also going to have a body with the update information. So now we need to put a comma after the string type here, and then we'll use that body decorator once again. And in after that, instead of inside of that, we'll have our user update, and that's just what I'm going to call this to identify it. And we'll say that is also an empty object for now. So then we're just going to return not only the ID in this new object, but we'll also spread in whatever data we get for that user update. So this will be the object that's returned now when we send a patch request. So let's try that out back here in Thunder Client, switch over to a patch, there it is, and we still have some information here to update. So let's say we're updating this user and we're switching the name to uh, Dan. Let's try that and now we'll go ahead and send the information. And I got a 404 and the reason that I got a 404 was I just sent that to slash users. I didn't say what user with the ID param that I wanted to update. So I need to send something in place of that ID param here. So I'll just send the number one. Let's send that again. And now we got the 200 and yes, we returned that same information. And of course we had ID in there first and then we spread in the information that we sent. So that route is also working as long as we put an ID in the URL as well. Now let's go back to the controller because we still have a delete route to create. I'll just delete both of these here at the top as well as so we no longer need that comment. Now under this, let's go ahead and copy the find one once again, and I'm going to paste it right underneath the patch. So there we go. I'll scroll just a little bit. Now this needs to be delete instead of get. So we'll do that. Press tab once again, so it should import at the top. We still need to pass in the ID so we know which user to delete. I'll switch this do the delete method here in our comment as well. This won't be a find one function. We'll rename this delete. We still need to use the param decorator and identify the ID here, and the ID is still a string type. Let's just return that ID as well. So this should be the delete route. Okay, we'll save, and from here we'll go back, and we will now test out the delete route. Once again, it needs that ID in the URL. It doesn't really need the body, but it won't hurt to leave it in there either way. So I'll just click over here to query. Let's go ahead and send that and we get the ID back. So all of the routes we've created are now working, but there's one type of parameter we haven't handled yet. And you see that listed right here in Thunder Client, query parameters. So let's take a look at that in our controller as well. I'm going to scroll back up to our first route here that has find all. So we're just getting all of the users. And what if we also wanted to allow that to filter for a query parameter? So I'll put or here and we might have slash users and then we might have something like role equals value. And this is a query parameter. It's different than a param that you would find in the URL like you see here with the ID. Here you'd have the question mark, role equals value. If you had a second query parameter, you might have the ampersand and then have something like age equals another value. And of course you would put whatever age you want there, 42, 28, doesn't matter. So those are query params. Let's handle that in our find all as well. So it needs to be optional and that is one thing, but another is we need to say at query, I'll press tab here and that should import at the top. Let's make sure, yep, we've got query right there. I'm also going to press alt Z so it just wraps that line down. It's getting a little long. But after our at query, we need to say inside of here what the query param that we're looking for is. And this will be role. 
Now after that, we need to define role, and we can do that with our TypeScript here. So we'll say this is optional, so we have the question mark and then a colon, and then this is going to have several possible values. One would be intern. After that, let's also say this could be an engineer. And then eventually, let's also have an admin, as you saw with the user where I was trying to add a user that was an admin. So these are the three possible values that we are identifying with TypeScript for role, but it is optional. And again, we're not handling the logic there, but we'll go ahead and try to send this as well through Thunder Client. So we'll go back to Thunder Client. Let's go back to our Git request. Let's just get all users. And now I'm going to put in a question mark and say role. Let me put in lowercase equals. And I'll put in admin like this. Let's go ahead and send. And yes, we got an empty array back once again. But we just want to know that it can handle something like that. Also note how Thunder Client handles the query param here. You could enter them here. If we uncheck, it removes that as well. If we check, it puts it back in the URL up above. So now you know how to handle both params in the URL, like you see here with the user's ID, and also query params like you see here with the role. We also know how to get the body out of a post request or a patch, or if we sent a put request where we're using the body as well. Now in the next lesson, we're going to cover the logic, what we'll create inside of our user's service and inject into our controller class that can handle the logic that we want here to do the appropriate things with the data. Because right now we're not getting the data we want, we're just getting something back to prove that our routes are correct. But this is the skeleton of the controller that has all of the routes handled for our user's REST API. Now we previously used the CLI to create our files. So just as a quick review, we're going to work on a provider today. And we would create that provider by typing nest g service and then the provider name. And we're creating a users provider. So we would type users. Now we already have that in our code from a previous lesson, but I just wanted to recap that if you need to create a provider today. So let me go ahead and delete that. And let's go to our source folder, not the package JSON here, where I have changed this to lesson three. And now in the source folder, we'll find the users directory. And in here we have our module and we have the controller that we worked on in the last lesson. And now today for the routes that we have in the controller, we need to create methods inside of a service that hold the logic. And then we'll inject that service back into this controller before we're finished. And we can see in our module that we have our provider right here and we've imported the user service. And so we're using that user service in our provider slot here. Now, if we come over here to the users.service that was created with that command line I just showed you, you can see we have a very empty file right now that just has the basics of a provider service. So what we have is import injectable from nest common. Then we have the injectable decorator at the top. And then we have an empty class named user service. Now we'll build this in just a second, but let's take a look at the docs about providers. Now, like modules and controllers, providers are a fundamental concept in Nest. Now, why do we create a service when we're talking about providers? Well, a provider doesn't have to be a service, but it often is. So it says Nest classes may be treated as a provider, which can be services, repositories, factories, helpers, and so on. So they're not just limited to creating services, although that is often what we will do. Now, the main idea of a provider is that it can be injected as a dependency. And we're going to come back to more about dependency injection after we create our provider and we want to inject it into our controller. It basically means objects can have various relationships with each each other as they say here. So we're going to create some logic in our service that can be injected and then used in the controller. So let's go back now to VS Code and create our service. We're back in VS Code and now let's notice this injectable decorator that we have here at the top. Now what that does is attach 
metadata that declares this class that we're about to create, our user service class, can be managed by Nest. And we'll see how that works when we inject that into the controller. So now let's start out by creating our class. And we're going to start with a property to begin. I'm going to say private. And then I'm going to create a user's property. And now for this property, I'm just going to set some data as we're not connecting a database today, but we want to have some data to work with. So I just posted in an array here or pasted in an array of five user objects. You can see they each have an ID, name, email, and role. So that is a property inside this user service class. So we said private users and we set that property. Now we're ready to create some methods inside of our service. Now, typically we name the methods after the routes that we have in the controller. So let's look at the controller quickly. We can see we have a find all for our get route. We also have a find one. So we want both of those as methods as well. Then we have a create, update, and a delete. So we will be creating five methods that match all of these, of course, that come after the HTTP method of get for the first two, then post, patch, and delete. So let's go back to the service file once again, and now let's create those methods. So the first one is find all, and now it had an optional role, and we'll want to indicate that here as well. So here is the optional role, and then we had an intern role that was possible. We also had an engineer role, if I could spell that correctly, and then admin. So any one of these are a possibility for the role value in find all. After that, let's go ahead and create what goes inside the method. And the first thing we want to do is check to see if a role was passed. So we'll say if role, then we'll handle that differently. So now we'll say return and we'll say this dot users. So that refers to our users above the users property and it's an array so we can filter that. And now we would only return the users with the role that was specified. So here we would say user in our filter, which is a higher order array method. And then we'll say user dot role, and we want it to match whatever role was passed in. So this would only return the users that have the role that was passed in. Now, if no role was passed, then underneath we can just return all users. And we would do that with return this dot users. Now that completes our find all method. Let's go ahead and scroll just a little bit more. Let's create the find one method. Now it's going to come in with an ID. This ID is going to be a number when this method receives it. So inside of this now we'll say const user. We'll set this equal to this dot users. Now we will find instead of filter. Once again, have a user here as this is another array method. And now we'll take the user ID needs to match the ID number. Now, after we have that, we can just return the user. Okay, let's scroll for a little more room as our create method will take up just a little more space. So we'll start with create. And now this is going to receive a user. And this would be an object. Here we need to specify what's in the user object. In the past, we just had an empty object when we created our controller routes. Now I'm going to say the user that we create is going to need a name, which is a string. I'm going to need an email, which is a string. And it's going to need a role. Now that role is specific. So it needs to be either an intern or engineer or it could possibly be an admin user. Spell that correctly also. Once I have all three of those in, it looks like we're finished. I'm going to press Alt-Z to wrap that down now. So we've got the possibilities here for a new user. And now, of course, an ID will need to be created. Now, we're not connected to a database where a database would typically auto-generate that ID. So let's put in just a little bit of logic to create that ID. So I'm going to say const and then users by highest ID. I'm going to set this equal to, and I don't want to sort the actual user's property that we have inside of our class. So I'm going to create a new array. I'm going to pass in this dot users. And now after that, I want to sort the array. And I'm going to have an A and a B here, as I typically would with a sort function. And then I'm going to take the B dot ID, which is a number, 
minus the a.id. So this should give us an array here of users by highest ID. Once we have that, I'm going to define a new user and I'm going to take an ID here and generate a new one. So I'm going to have an ID that I'm going to add to this user that we received that has a name, email, and role. And this ID is going to be equal to users by highest ID. We'll take the first element and then the ID property, and then we'll add one to it. So we're generating the next highest ID. The new person that is added will have a higher ID. And after that, we'll spread in the rest of the user that we received. So that is our new user. All of that's just to generate that ID that is already not in the data, or not already in the data, I should say. So now we'll have this.users.push, and we'll push in that new user to the array. Then we just want to return new user. And that's all we should need for our create method. Now let's scroll for some more room again, but I don't want to scroll this off of the top because I'll use just a little bit of that. So I'm going to say update. And now once again, this needs to receive an ID so we know what user to update. So this would be an ID of number, and then we'll call this updated user. Now this would be an object here, and this is going to receive the same information we would with any other user. We can't update the ID, but we could these other three properties of the object. So I'm going to put in that same information here for the types. However, we don't have to update all three of these, so they should all be optional. So we'll put in the question mark to make each one of them optional as well. So after name, email, and role, they're all optional for the update method. Now inside of this update method, we're going to map over the users. So I'll say this.users equals, and now I'll have this.users.map. Now I'll have a user here. And after that, I'm going to go ahead and put in another bracket here. So we're going to have to use a return. It's not a one-liner. I'll say if user.id equals the ID that is passed into our method, then we're going to return, we'll spread in the user, and then we'll spread in the updated user as well. So what this will do is spread in all of the properties of the existing user, and then the updated user will just overwrite whatever property it contains, so it comes after the user. Okay, after we do that, Otherwise, underneath here, we'll just say return user. Actually, that's not otherwise. That should still be part of this this.users equals. Then so we end up returning the user, I guess, if it didn't match here. So this.user still contains all of the users. Now, at the bottom of this, we're going to say return this dot find one. So we're going to call another method inside of our class and we'll pass that ID because after we've updated all of the users, we only want to return the updated user. And so we just use the find one method. And finally, we have our delete method. So I will now, let me make sure we've completed this correctly. Yes, so now I'll scroll up here for more room and we'll create the delete method this is going to receive an ID only, which is a number. And inside of this method, we will define our removed user set this equal to this dot find one and we'll pass in the ID that we get. So we need this removed user defined separately so we can hold it in that variable. Then we'll take this dot users, we'll set this equal to this dot users dot filter and we'll remove the user that needs removed. So user dot ID not equal to the ID that's passed in. So that will exclude that user that needs to be removed and will no longer be in this user. So we couldn't use find one at this point. We needed to save the removed user up here instead of trying to use the find one method like we did with update. So now we will just return removed user. That finishes our methods and completes our user's service class. So we have all five methods Plus, we have a property that has our beginning data here with the five users in it.
Now with the service complete, let's look at the module. We can see we imported the user service when that mod or when the service was created into the module and it's listed here with the provider. So we're going to need to import the user service into the controller now as well. So let's scroll to the top of the controller. I'll press Alt Z to wrap anything down that needs to be. Now I'll say import, we'll import the user's service and it comes from our dot slash users dot service file that we have over here. Now, once we've done that, we need to go ahead and inject it into the controller. So let's go back to the docs quickly to discuss dependency injection just a little more. We're back in the docs, and what I want to highlight is this sentence right here where it says, in the example below, Nest will resolve the cat service, which they're giving an example of a cat's service, not a user service, it says by creating and returning an instance of the cat service, or in the normal case of a singleton, returning the existing instance if it's already been created elsewhere. Now that's a strong point for that. So what this does is it creates and returns an instance, and we do that with a constructor here. So constructor private cat service, and then we list our cat service that we created. So we're going to do that with users. But what's important to highlight is it's better than if we just created a new user service or new cat service like we typically would in code, because if it's already created elsewhere, it's a singleton and Nest.js knows that and it returns the existing instance. So that's an important benefit here from Nest.js. Let's go back and add this to our code. We're back in VS Code and let's go ahead and add this instance now of our service to our controller. We're injecting it into that and we do that with constructor and then we'll say private and then we'll also say read only and then we'll add users service and then we'll list the users service that we created. And as we read in the docs, that actually creates a instance of that user service. We also need the little curly braces out here and they're just empty, but we need those out here so we don't see all the red squigglies that you saw in my code before that. Now, again, this, of course, if it was created elsewhere, another instance, it pulls it in because Nest.js identifies that it, it's a singleton and that's what they call that when you've only got an object that could be created once like that. But if we were to have to create this without the Nest.js benefit, we would do something like const users service equals new users service. And you may have seen that in your JavaScript code before. Of course, it's giving me an error here because we already have it there. But this is essentially Nest.js is handling this line for us, but it's doing a little bit more than that. It's also saying, hey, if we created this elsewhere, it's going to find that and pull it in. So we need that at the top, and now we can use our user service inside of these routes. So let's go ahead and update our routes. And so now instead of the return with an empty array here, all we need to do is say this.userService.findAll, see I'm calling a method, and I'm passing in a role if it was received. And that's all we need here for our find all in this git route. Now after that, we can update our find one. Now this is going to be just a little different as well. So let's go ahead and remove that and we'll say return. This would be this.userService.find one, not find all. And now inside of this, we would pass in the ID. But notice we have a problem here. The ID has a red squiggly because we're receiving an ID as a string. And that's how it's going to be sent because it's a param. All params are strings. We can't change that. So we need to convert this to handle a number, which is what our find one method expects. We could use the number constructor or parse int, but we could also use a unary. And we'll do that simply by adding a plus in front. Now let's quickly look at the MDN docs on a unary. We're in the MDN docs and I'm looking at a unary plus. Now this is just an easy way to convert something to a number. It doesn't document itself as well as say parse int, so you may prefer that. However, you can just add the plus and it's well documented here and it's a very quick and easy way to do that. And you'll find that a lot in Nest.js, even when it generates a REST API for us. And I'll show you how to do that in a future tutorial. But I just wanted you to know what the unary plus was for if you hadn't seen it. Now back to our code. Back in VS Code, I'm quickly going to jump to the delete 
in our controller before we get to the create and update. So now here in the delete, we're once again receiving a string for the ID, and we're going to return this dot user service dot delete. And this would once again receive the ID, and it once again needs the unary plus to be converted into a number. So now let's go to the create and the update. And they just need a little bit more work because our type here is still currently an empty object. So we're going to have to make that match the methods that we have back in the user. So to do that, I'm just going to go back here to the user service that we have, scroll down to the create, and now we have a type here that has the name and an email, both strings, and then it has the possible values for role. So I'm going to copy that type, come back to the controller, and now I'm going to put that inside of create method here, instead of that empty object. Now, of course, you might be thinking, now we've had to put that same definition in two places. It might be better to have a place where we put that definition once, and we will do that in the next video. I'm going to complete this first, and then we'll talk about what all we will cover in the next video. So here we've got the create method, and we should be receiving a body that has a user and that user's information, and it needs to match that. And of course, we're not validating that yet either. That's also something that will happen in the next video. Right now, we're just going to return, and this would be this.usersService.create. And now that the types match, we could pass in user. And of course, if the type didn't match, we would have a red squiggly under user. Now we need to do the same thing for our update here in the patch route or the patch method and then it calls update. So here, let's go back to the users.service, go to the update, and we'll get this type here. And remember, all of these were optional was the difference. Come back to the controller, and now our user update type, paste that in as well. And now when we return here, we're going to return this.usersService.update, now it needs the ID, which needs to be a number. So again, plus ID because it comes in as a string. And then it also needs the user update that we pass in. And now it looks good. With the changes to our controller now complete, well, let's go ahead and start our dev server and test these endpoints out before we finish. So control back tick to open the terminal. Now notice I am in the parent directory for the Nest.js series over here. I never went directly into the lesson three folder, which is probably where you are directly in your project folder. So I'm going to CD into lesson 03, and now I'm in the project folder for this lesson. And that's of course where we can start our dev server. So you're probably in there already. You can just type npm run start colon dev to start up the Nest.js dev server here. And let's get it all running. Before we test it out there, everything is running as expected. Let's close that. And now I'm going to use Thunder Client. You could use Postman or any other software you want to test the endpoints. I'll open Thunder Client here, create a new request. And for that request, we need to go to HTTP colon slash slash localhost 3000. And we're running this at slash users. I don't want a space at the end. I just want it like that. And now I'm going to send the request and we should get all of our users back. Here's all five users. I'll pull this up so we can see the results a little bit better. But that's what we had in that property in our services class for our starting data, just those five users. Now let's say we just want to get user with the ID of two. We put that param in the URL and send. There we've got the user with ID of two. Now let's create a new user. We'll go to the body here. I'm going to create an object. And now we should be able to send some information. So I'm going to send name, and we'll say that is what needs to be a string there as well. Dave, and then we had email. And for email, we'll say Dave at DaveGray.codes. And from there, let's go ahead and say role. And of course, I need to be an admin. And we'll close out our object there. That's our body that we're sending now, and we'll send that to the post. Let's see if this works. Oh, also, it's not going to post slash two. It once again just needs to go to localhost 3000 slash users, our main endpoint. Let's see what happens. 
And we had 201 created and we got that information back. Here is ID of three. So ID of three, I don't know if I like that. Let me go ahead and check that services just to see what happened because we already had five users. So let's see our ID up here. Maybe I'd put myself in here. No, Clementine was there. So let's go back and see what we've got here. Uh, create, let's look at this, bring this in. We create the highest ID. Oh, the sort, sort has an equals here. This should be a minus. We wanted to say b.id minus a.id. There is the issue. So now let's see if our server restarted. We hopefully it did here. I think so. Yep, it restarted. So that once again should reset those properties that we have those user properties. So now let's go ahead and put a get request back in just to make sure we only get five users. So there's one, two, three is Clementine as expected, four, five. Good deal. Now let's go back to our post. Now that we have fixed that, we're going to send in this user. Might be a little bit easier to read if we put this on new line for each one here. So we've got a user named Dave, email, and a role. And we that on a new line. Also, did I get rid of it by mistake? Great, I did. There we go. Let's go ahead and send this to the post request at localhost 3000 users. Send. Oh, now I've got a bad request because I do have an extra token in there. Let me get rid of that. It's down there. Yeah, extra token. Let's try it one more time. This looks correct. Send. Okay, now user ID of six. That's what I expected because we added a new user. It counted up, got the highest ID. Here's that information of the new user. Now, while we have our server still running and we haven't made any changes, so it didn't restart, let's request all users again. Now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So our new user has been added to the users that we have there inside of the user's property. That's what we wanted. Now let's send an update and we would do that with a patch request. And let's go back to the body because that's what we can change here. And let's change the role to engineer. And let's go ahead and send this. And we got a 404 not found. Why is that? Because we didn't say which user we were updating. We didn't send the ID. So now at this point, let's update user six. And we don't really need to send the name and the email again, although we could, it will just update all of those. So let's just send the engineer information. Let's try this once again, send. Now it says it's okay. So here's what we got back. ID, name, Dave, email, still the same role engineer. So it only updated what we sent, which was the role of engineer. So once I, of course, form the request correctly, all was good. Now let's go ahead and delete one. And that would be the delete method over here. I'm going to go to users and let's delete user number three. So we'll send this. And of course, that user that we deleted is what is returned from our method. That's fine. But now when we check all users, and we don't want just user three, which probably isn't there. Let's get all the users. Now we've got one, two, and it skips to four, five, and six because we deleted user number three. Now you could definitely make what we have currently error out and you could send incorrect information because we're not validating that information as it comes in. And we're also not handling some errors that we could get. We're going to learn all about that in the next tutorial as well as what I was talking about before. We shouldn't have to keep the types here typed in manually and in the provider as well in our service for users. We should have one source for those. We're going to learn about DTOs also and how that can help us not only have our types, but also with the validation for that information that's coming in all in the next tutorial. In the previous lessons, we have set up a REST API with endpoints for users data. I just pressed control in the back tick. Let's go ahead and start up that REST API in dev mode with npm run start colon dev. That should start up our server in dev mode. And with the server running, let's check back here at our script and notice, of course, that it also has the watch flag. So anytime we make changes to our files, it's going to restart the server and keep it running for us. So our REST API is running, but we have no data validation for the requests that come in, and that can cause problems. Let's quickly look with ThunderClient 
And here I'm going to look at a request to the user's endpoint, and I can just send a value for role here. I'm going to just type my name in all caps. So role Dave, we know that doesn't exist. And if I request that, we get back an empty array. That's not really ideal. We'd like to fix that. What if we go to the endpoint where we can get a user, say we wanted user one, but let's send something like a couple of lowercase letters instead, and we send that, and it's a status okay, we just don't get anything back. That's not ideal either. And you can see we're going to continue to have problems with all of these endpoints if we don't send the correct data, because nothing is validating that or causing an error to send any message back to the user that says what is wrong. So we need to fix that today. And we're in the Nest.js docs looking at pipes. Now pipes are a specific type of middleware. And I'll scroll down just a little bit and it says pipes have two typical use cases, transformation, so transforming data, or validation. Now we'll be doing both today. Let's look at some quick examples. I want to go to built-in pipes and there's a couple of pipes here in this list that we're going to use. One is the validation pipe, the other is the parse int pipe. So let's head back to VS Code. Back in VS Code, we're in the users controller. So I've opened up my source directory and then the users directory where we've created all of our users files. And then I am in the users controller file. From there, we want to import that parse int pipe and it comes from Nest.js Common, just like all of these others that we have imported here at the top of this file. Now, after that, we need to go ahead and bind it to the method. In other words, we're inserting the pipe as middleware into a route handler. So let's look at how that works. So in any of these route handlers that needed the unary plus that we had previously used, we can use the parse int pipe. And let's do that by implementing it right here in the find one. So after our param decorator, and then we pass in the ID, let's put a comma, and then we'll say parse int pipe. And we're inserting that pipe right there. Now we'll no longer need that unary plus either. But we still have an issue with TypeScript because it's saying, hey, this is supposed to be a string here. Now we need to change this because it will be a number and TypeScript agrees that it will be a number. That's because this parse int pipe is transforming that data as we talked about. Now let's go ahead and make these changes to the other two route handlers that also were using that unary plus. So let's scroll down to our update because we had to send the ID there as well. So we'll add in our parse int pipe and then we'll change that type here to a number as well for the id and after that we can remove the unary plus as well let's do the same for the delete route handler so here this would be parse int pipe we'll change this to a number type here and then we can remove the plus as well and then save the file so let's go ahead and test one or more of these out. We'll go back to Thunder Client. I'll pull up our requests here. And now I'm going to send a double A once again to that find one route. And remember, we put the parse int pipe on this route. I'll send. Now we get a 400 bad request and we get a specific message. It says validation failed. The numeric string is expected or numeric string is expected. So yes, it needs to be a number. Of course, it's still a string. So it says numeric string. That's a very specific message and the double A's will no longer work. But if I go ahead and send the number one, then yes, we get user number one. And of course, we could expect that same behavior to be on the other two route handlers that we, of course, applied the parse int pipe to as well. So the parse int pipe transforms those string numbers to numeric data. And it also validates the request data because we receive an error if we send letters instead of numbers. However, we still need to validate data when we create a new user or update a user. And we can begin fixing these issues by creating data transfer object schemas or DTOs for the data we expect to receive from the request. So let's take another look at the docs. We are back in the Nest.js docs and I'm looking at request payloads under the controller page here in the overview section. And they show an example of a DTO they're going to create. And they also discuss why they use classes as well. Now note, DTO stands for data transfer object. And then of course they say schema afterwards because that's essentially what we're doing is creating a schema for our data. So you can see their create cat 
.dto.ts file here. And it has a name that's a string, an age that's a number, a breed that's a string. So essentially we're creating a type or a schema here. They're calling it a DTO and they're using a class because we're in NestJS and they base most everything on classes. So let's follow this same pattern back in VS Code and create a user DTO. I'm back in VS Code, we want to create a DTO folder inside of our users folder or directory, if you will. And here we'll call this DTO. And now inside of our DTO directory, the first file we create is going to be create dash user dot DTO dot TS. Now inside, this is fairly simple. We'll say export class then we say create DTO or I'm sorry, create user DTO, and now inside of our class, we'll have a name that is a string, and we're going to have an email that is a string, and then we're going to have a role. If you remember, we receive all of this data. Now, why don't we have an ID here? That's because we create the ID after we receive this data. This is a DTO or data transfer object for the data we will be receiving in the request. And of course, the role has three possible values. We had intern, or it could be engineer, or it could be admin. But we also need a DTO for our update user. But before we do, we need to look at the docs one more time. Back in the NestJS docs, I'm now under the techniques header and validation, and it says when building input validation types, also called DTOs, so that is what we are doing, then it says it's useful to build and create or create and update, I'm sorry, variations on the same type. Now, for example, the create variant may require all fields while the update variant, and that's the one we need to create now, doesn't require all of those fields. Essentially, we need a partial type, kind of like TypeScript again, right? So that's what we're going to do, but they show a great way to do this. Here is that create cat DTO again, that same example. But when we scroll down, it says by default, all of the fields above are required. But now below, we can extend that type we have, the create cat DTO with the partial type. And that's all we're going to need to do for our update class. We don't need to type out the same types again. So we're going to create an update class by extending the create class we have using the partial type function. Let's go back and follow this same pattern in our code. Back in VS Code, I need to create another new file inside the DTO directory. So I'll click new file and I want this to be update. I'm sorry, I need all lowercase here. Update dash user dot DTO dot TS. Now to start this out, we need to import our create user DTO that we previously made. Then we also need to import partial type. And that is going to come from at nestjs slash mapped types. And that is not installed by default. And I just remembered that we need to go ahead and add that dependency as well. I'll press control and the back tick to once again open up a terminal. I'm going to temporarily do control C to close down our dev server and we'll add this dependency and start it back up. So now I'm going to type npm i and then I want at nestjs slash mapped dash types. And from there, we're also going to say dash capital D because this would be a dev dependency. So let's press enter should install this to our project fairly quickly. Then we'll go ahead and restart that server. I'm going to press my up arrow just to get my previous commands. There's my npm run start colon dev. Go ahead and press enter, restarts the dev server. Everything should be working once again. And now we no longer have the squiggly under our partial type import here at the top because now it has the dependency that it comes from, which is the nest JS slash mapped types. And I've worked with Next.js some this week, so if I've said one instead of the other, I apologize. It's easy to get switched up between Nest.js and Next.js, two completely different things. So now let's create this class by typing export class, and we want to say update user DTO extends. Now we use our partial type function, and inside of the partial type, we pass in our create user 
DTO, but we're not quite finished. This would still be an error right now. We just need empty curly brackets at the end, and then you can save the file and it's complete. So we extend and we get all of the benefits of the create user DTO, except not any one particular field is required. We can use that partial type, which is perfect for our update route handler. So we've created our DTOs, but we aren't using them yet. So we need to add them to the controller and then to the service provider. We're going to do both of those. And you can already tell the benefit we'll be having our types all in one place. So I'll go to the user's controller first. We'll scroll to the top and we need to go ahead and import our DTOs. So we'll say import create user DTO. And then after that, we'll go ahead and import update user DTO. Now that we have both of those, let's apply them in the file. We need to go down to our create method that we have in our post route. And now instead of having our type typed out here for user, we can switch that and we can just put in our create user DTO. And that brings in the type. Now a pattern you would commonly see here, instead of this being called user, for example, you might see also create user DTO with a lowercase in the spot of user here. And then that would be passed in or user is passed in there. And so you would see this, but this still represents the user. So either way you do that is fine. I just wanted to point that out. That is a typical pattern. So I'm going to leave it and switch these as we go. So now in our patch route here with the update function, we can do the same thing. We have user update, and then we have this long type typed out. And instead, we can bring in our update user DTO and put it right there. And then we could follow that same pattern with a lowercase update and then user DTO here still represents the user. So I'll copy that and replace the user update that we had and just put it right there. It still represents the same thing. And now let's go to our service provider. And in the user service provider, we can import these at the top again. So we will import create user DTO. And after that, we will import update user DTO. And then we need to put both of these in the functions that use them as well. So we had our create function here. Let me press Alt Z to wrap that down. Once again, we can replace this long type that we manually had to type and we're storing it all in one place now, which is our create user DTO. And then we could switch this to follow that same pattern where it says user here, it would be create user DTO, and you're starting with the lowercase create user, but then you need to replace where we had the user inside of our function logic as well. And it was right here where we spread the user. So that should fix that. And we're following that same pattern that you will likely see somewhere else, which is why I'd like to introduce that. And then in the update area, we have the same thing where we're replacing the type that was there. And now it is our update user DTO and we're switching updated user. So I'll control D to select both. And we'll switch this to update user DTO starting out lowercase, which represents the updated user once again. With our controller and our service provider both updated, we are now using those DTOs to replace those types that we had to type out more than once. And that's a good benefit, but they're still not really validating anything. They are still just pretty much doing the same job that TypeScript does. So we need to apply some validation as well. Back in the Nest.js docs, once again, we're under the overview section on the pipes page, and it's talking about an implementation of validation. And it says Nest works well with the class validator library. So we're going to add a couple more dependencies. These won't be dev dependencies. We'll list those amongst our production dependencies. So we'll add those in just a second. But I want to show you the example once again with their create cat DTO class. They are bringing in some new decorators from this class validator dependency that we add. But we also need note the class transformer dependency because they work together. So we'll have both of those. But we'll import the decorators from class validator. And then inside of our DTO, 
we can apply validation to each one of our data types that we have, and it will check for things like is int, is string. We can even check things to see like if we have an email or not. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of definitions. And just to show a few, I'm here on the GitHub page for that library, and I'm going to put a link to this inside of the course resources as well. So you can reference this any of these validation decorators that you would need will be in this library for you after we have added it as a dependency. So let's go back to VS Code and put this to use. We're back in VS Code. I'm going to open a terminal window, Control C once again to stop the server, and I'll just add these dependencies quickly. So we'll npm i, and then we want class dash validator, and then a space, and we can also say class dash transformer, press enter. Both of these should be added to our project fairly quickly. And yes, they are. We can double check that in the package JSON if we want to, and it should be uh, not in scripts, but here in dependencies, we see class transformer and class validator now. So that's what we need. From there, it looks like I didn't save something inside of our controller. I'll quickly do that as well. Now from there, let's go back to the DTO and we can apply these. Okay, at the top of the file, we need to import the decorators that we're going to use. So I'm going to import is email, and that comes from class validator. So let's just apply that one first. And of course, that's going to go on the email. I'm going to leave a couple of spaces there. Then we use the at symbol like we do with all decorators and just call is email right above it. Now, after that, let's go ahead and add is enum. And we will use that with our roles here. So now let's get a little more space and we'll say at is enum and we can call that, but we need to pass in the values inside of this. So this is going to be an array with these different values. So I'm just going to copy these and put the values inside of that array that we have there. Now that's the first param in our is enum. After that, Let's put in the curly braces and we can provide a message if they don't provide one of the required enum values. And we'll say valid role required. So that goes directly above our role type here. And TypeScript's giving me a warning here, and it's a good thing that it is because this is not a union type that we put in the array and I'm still separating it with the same divider that I would for a union type. We need commas here. So let's also replace dividers. And here we now have what our is enum decorator needs, an array with the different values that we also provided here. But we need to make sure we don't use these inside of there. Okay, after that, we still need to apply a couple of things to the name data that we're getting. So let's bring in is not empty and let's also bring in is string so we can apply both of those so we hadn't done that yet where we're applying two to one type of data we just do one on each line so we'll say is string and we'll call is string so we check that first we'll also check is not empty because we don't want an empty string which is a possibility and now this is a good time for a reminder that we don't need to apply any to our update user dto because it's already extending the partial type of create user DTO. So we've applied all of the validation here and it will be passed over to our update user DTO as well. And we've applied validation to our DTOs, but we cannot really check the requests that are coming in until we apply the validation pipe. So now we need to go back to our user's controller we need to bring in the validation pipe. Now we already have the parse int pipe, so we'll just put it right after that. Here we have validation pipe that is brought in. Now once we do that, let's go down to the create here, and we'll put the validation pipe right after the body, well right inside actually, the body decorator, where the validation pipe would go. Now, this will validate against our DTO, and we'll get uh, messages that will make sense if we have the wrong information, and we'll test that out. Let's go ahead and put the validation pipe also, though, inside of our patch route here where we're sending an update. We already have the parse int pipe here. Then notice we have the body decorator here once again, and we can pass that validation type, or validation pipe, rather, right inside of it. So now we have the validation pipe in place for the create 
under the post method here and the update under the patch method. So now let's go ahead and try out some requests with those in mind. Let's bring Thunder Client back over and let's go to the patch route here. Let's patch number one. Let's try to send an email, Dave. You can see this was different earlier. Let's see what we get here. Oh, we don't have the server started. Let's go ahead and control backtick, npm run start colon dev. Once we get that running, of course, we can test out our request. So it should just take a second. Server is now up and running in dev mode. Let's try this again. We're not sending a valid email here. We're just sending my name. Send this. And the message we get back is email must be an email. So if we were to switch this and say Dave at DaveGray.codes and send, then everything looks good and we're actually getting the updated user back and the email has been updated to the email that we sent. So that is correct. Let's try something else out. Let's send a different uh, role. Let's go ahead and say role and let's just say that role is Dave. And once we send that, now we get valid role required with a bad request status. And that is very useful to the user. Now they know what is wrong with their request, not that it's just a bad request. Let's try one more. Let's send something to the name field and let's try an empty string and send that along. It said name should not be empty. So that specifically related back to that decorator that we said is not empty. Let's go ahead and try something else instead of a string, maybe the number one, two, three, send that. Now name must be a string. So all of that validation is in place and working. And we could expect that same validation to work to the post route as well. Let's go ahead and try one here. We are going to post, of course, this would go just to users. And now once again in the body, we need to send some information here. Let's send name and we'll say name is Dave. And then for email, let's go ahead and send Dave at, and let's just leave it at that. And then let's send a role and the role can be one of the valid roles if we want. Let's go ahead and say intern and let's go ahead and send this and bad request. Oh, unexpected token. Once again, let me get rid of that extra comma there and see if that fixes it. Yes, email must be an email now. Let's get just a little more room if we can, we could see that better. So email must be an email. Let's switch that back to davegray.codes and let's switch name now to an empty string and we'll send that and we can see name should not be empty. So all of that same validation is applying to both routes to our different classes. Of course, the update user was extended from the create user DTO. Now all of this in place, we could still have an issue, say if we went to the users route, uh, sending a get request and we just simply request a user like user 99, doesn't exist. We still get an empty response and that's not what we want either. And that's where we're going to dive into error handling. So let's take a look at that. Back in the docs, we can see that Next.js has some built-in HTTP exceptions and we can use those in our code. We're going to specifically use the not found exception. So let's go back and see how this applies. Back in VS Code, I wanna to go to the file tree and I want to go to my service provider here. I'm going to scroll up because I want to apply this not found error or not found exception inside of the find one where right now, if uh, we requested user 99 as we did, we didn't receive any message in return to say anything was wrong. So at the very top, once again, we need to import that not found exception. So we will import not found exception comes from nest.js common. And now we can use that in our code. So I'll scroll back down to the find one. Let's find that, there we go. And now we can just put in a little bit of a logic line here to check to see. We'll say if we didn't find a user. So if we don't have a user, instead of returning nothing, say row new not found exception. And now we can pass in a message. So here we'll say user not found. And now we could go ahead and try that out because we had that ready in Thunder Client. Let's go back. Let's once again request user 99 and see what happens when we send this. We could ignore the body here. This is just a get request. 
send this. Now we get a 404 not found and we get the specific message user not found. That's exactly what we wanted. Now what about when we would send a specific role? So here we could say users and then we have our role param and let's set this equal to intern and of course we should receive something here. Yes we do. But now let's go ahead and switch this say Dave and of course we're not checking against that in this specific route handler because that's not where we put the validation pipe because role doesn't have to be sent we don't know if we're receiving role or not so if we do then we just need to check to see if it's found or not right now it just returns an empty array no other message that's once again not what we want let's go back to our service provider there we are and now inside of the find all where we're checking role, we can add just a little more logic here as well. Instead of simply returning whatever we have here inside, like we are now, where if we have a role, then we are returning this line where it filters for all the users with the role. And of course, it might not find any, and that's where we get the empty array. Let's define our roles array here. So, so we'll say const roles array equals, and now, it may be empty or it may not be, but we have just defined it. And so now we can say if, and there's two different ways you can do this. I say if we check to see if the length is equal to zero, like this, uh, length, it's an array, so it definitely has the length property. If that length is equal to zero, that really spells out, it kind of says in the code what I'm doing. The other would be to just flip this with the exclamation mark. So now, if, the length was zero, we would flip that value from false to true, and whatever was behind this if statement would also happen. But I'm just going to switch it back because I think more will understand if I say roles array dot length equals zero, then we're going to do something. And what we're going to do is throw new not found exception. And then inside of this, we'll say user role not found. And otherwise, of course, if the uh, length is there, essentially we do have some users with the role that's requested, we're going to return the roles array. Other than that, we can leave this the way it was. So let's save this now, and let's go back and make another request here in Thunder Client. And this would be users, role Dave, just like we did before where we had the empty array. Now we send this, and we get the 404 not found with the user role not found message. Much more helpful than simply getting an empty array with a 200 status. Okay, to quickly recap today, we have created DTOs. Those are data transfer objects that we use as schemas, and we can also use them with pipes to validate the incoming request data. And we learned about pipes as well, which are a special type of middleware. And finally, we learned about handling some errors that we might get or we might want to throw on purpose when requests are sent in with invalid data. Now in the next tutorial, we're going to get rid of our user's data here that we used as a sample, and we're actually going to connect to a database with an ORM. Today we'll be using Neon for our database. You can see it's a serverless Postgres and it's very easy to work with and there's good documentation. Likewise, we'll be using Prisma for the ORM. Now I've had many different requests for database technology and ORM technology as I've been building this series and there's no way I can make everyone happy. However, I haven't used Neon or Prisma on my YouTube channel yet and so that's what I'm going to create this tutorial with. Again, there is great documentation and it will allow us to move forward quickly. Let's start on the neon.tech website today and I'll have a link to this in the description and you can see it right up here in the URL bar. And you want to sign up for a free account at Neon. Now I'm going to sign in, I already have an account and you should be able to do that with your GitHub account if you have one, for example. Now you can see I have an example project in here called my example DB. You'll want to create a new project after you sign up and you might have to verify your email address with Neon. I can't remember remember if I did that or not, but that's a good possibility. Okay, once you have a new project, we'll go into the project and you should see your dashboard. Now in the dashboard, you're going to have a database area here and you're going to want to create a new database. And you can see I have a database named Dave's-ExampleDB. 
And then below that, there is a connection string. Now from here, we're going to choose the drop down menu and we can scroll and let's find, uh, let me see what I'm looking for here, Prisma, there we go. And once we find Prisma, also make sure your pooled connection is checked here. Once you have Prisma selected, and I'll scroll this up so you can see everything, we're going to use this code that's in here. It's saying put this code right here in the .env file, and then put this code, and we haven't created it yet, but in the schema.prisma file that's in the Prisma folder. And it allows you to copy all of this code. One thing to note, if you highlight and then control C to copy like this, you're going to get these asterisks in here that's hiding my unique value that they give me. That's a good thing that it's hiding that I shouldn't see yours and you shouldn't see mine. However, you don't want to copy those asterisks. You want to copy the actual secret code that's underneath that. And you can show that by clicking the I icon right here, but you can also, without showing it, click copy and it should copy the actual values that are underneath. So you might want to do that now. Click copy and save this information in another file because we shouldn't need to come back to the NEON website until we're checking to see if we've actually saved data to our online database. So go ahead and copy that information and let's move on. And now we're back in VS Code. Let's go ahead and add Prisma to our project. We're going to do this at the terminal. So I'll press Control back tick, open up a terminal window. And here I'm going to type npm i Prisma dash capital D. That will add Prisma as a dev dependency in our project. When this is complete, we're going to initialize Prisma as well, and it will create a folder in our project with a couple of things we need. So here it's finished now. Now let's type npx Prisma init and press enter. This will create the folder I was talking about, and it should also create a .env file. Now you can see we have a message here with some instructions, but I'm going to walk you through everything we need to do. You can read these, of course, if you want to. I'll go ahead and close that out. And now we see the .env file here. It's got some instructions in it. It's got an example database URL string. But remember from Neon, they gave us actually two strings we need. And that is true with Neon. We'll need that. One is a direct URL that we use in the terminal, essentially, is how we connect to our database. And the other, of course, is the database URL. And it also has to do with using pooled connections. So let's grab those. You should have saved those already when I mentioned that. But if you didn't, you can still get them here inside the uh, Neon dashboard. We need both of these, the database URL and the direct URL. Remember, if you copy them like I am, you're going to get the asterisks here. But you should use this copy icon down here. And then you'll get the values you need for your Neon account. So I'm just going to copy these, show you how I would put them inside of this .env file. I'm going to select the string that they have in here now and that value. Then I'm going to control V to paste these others in. Also alt Z just to wrap everything down so we can see it. So we have two values that we want in the .env file. Now I'm going to put in my actual values, not the asterisks here, but I won't let you see those values of course, because they're for my account. So go ahead and you should have these values in here with your values, not the asterisks. And now we're looking inside the Prisma folder that was created in our project, and we've got a file named schema.prisma. You can see in here we've got a generator client defined, and it has a provider value. Then we've got the data source DB that is here also. Now notice here we have URL equals that database URL value that we have in the ENV file. Now we need to put a little bit more in here and we can look back at the NEON website again where we can copy this information and see what we have here, data source, DB, provider URL, and direct URL. We need all of that. So what I can do is just copy URL and direct URL and use both of these, or we could just copy all of this, but then of course it copies what's above as well. So here's data source DB. I'll just copy the whole object. Now let's bring it back to our project. Make sure they're named the same as well. Yes, we've got data source DB here. It's got a provider and a URL. I'm just going to replace all of that, control V, now we have direct URL here, we have the proper values everywhere, and we're ready to move forward again.
Now the next step, and you may not be seeing the color code here like I am already, I'm not for sure, but the next step is to make sure you do see the color code in the files we're working with. To do that, get the Prisma VS Code extension. I already have it installed, and so that's why my file was already color coded if yours wasn't. So go ahead and install this Prisma extension, and that way you'll see the color coding in the files like I am in the rest of this tutorial. Now that you've added that, we need to model data inside of our schema.prisma file. I'm in the Prisma docs and we're just looking at the quick start here and I've already got us started so we're on step two of the quick start in the docs. But this shows an example of the schema.prisma file here where they're modeling data. Now we're just going to have one model today but here's a really good example where they have a post that's related back to the user. We're not going to use a relation but you can see how that is shown here and you might want to learn more about creating models and you can do that in the Prisma docs. But I'm going to show you several things about the data with a model today. So I wanted you to see this example. Now let's go back to VS Code and set up our employee model. Back in VS Code, I'm going to scroll for just a little bit of room and we can define our model just below our database. So let's go ahead and say model, then employee. And now inside of this, we're going to have an ID. Now let's go ahead and use tabs here just to space everything over and maybe a couple of tabs. And then it's going to be type INT. And now we'll also say, I'll do two more tabs, give it an at ID. This will make it a unique ID. And you can see this here, defines a single field ID on the model. And that's what we want. Now also let's give this a default value. So now we use the at symbol and default. And inside let's say auto increment. This would be typical that we have in a database. So as we add a new employee, it increments the ID one more value and moves forward. After that, let's go ahead and set up the name. And for the name, let's say, I'm doing space each time I want a tab. Let's say this is a string. I'll do another tab and we could make this unique, and then I may come back and change this just to show you how to change a model, but for now we'll make it unique. Say email, that's also going to be a string, and we'll say it is also unique, as we would expect an email to be unique. Then we can give this a role, so our employees will have roles. Previously we looked at a user example, now we're setting up something new, but essentially the same type of data here. And we had a role enum at that point. We can define that as well. So I'm just going to set this as role and then we'll define that enum here in just a minute. On the next line, let's have created at. So we know when this record was created. So this would be a date time type. Now let's give this a default. And inside the default, we can just say now and call that and that will give it the current date time. Then we'll also have an updated at, which is also a date time. And now this is nice because you can just say at updated at, and this will actually insert the new value that where it was updated or the current date time. You don't have to pass in now or anything for updated at. Now we need to define our role here, which should be an enum. So underneath we can define role as an enum, and then it will just have our three values. Let's say intern, engineer, and admin. And now that we've defined the enum role here, we can use it up here in the employee model. With our data modeled, we're now ready to run a migration, which will actually create our employee table in our database at Neon. And I'll show you how that works. But first of all, let's talk about what we've got here. We've got employee, which essentially represents a table of data that we will have. So this is the data we expect to be in our table. And now when we run this migration, we're going to actually save the SQL, I usually say SQL, the SQL statements that are executed on our database. And we'll see those, and I'll show you the command to do that. And of course, it'll discuss a couple of options you could use as well. So let's open up a terminal window again, because we're going to run these at the command line. And so now that we have this, let's go ahead and type npx, oh, let me use lowercase, npx prisma, and then I want migrate. Now here's the value that will be different depending on what you were doing. I'm going to type dev. This is going to save the SQL statements in a folder inside of our prisma folder. You could instead type push, there we go, push, 
And that, of course, would do the same thing, except it won't save those SQL statements for you to reference later. I like having those saved to see what was executed on the database. Another option is deploy. If you were working with a local database first and then you wanted to send those changes to the online deployment, you would use that. Of course, we're not doing that. We're working directly with our online Postgres database at Neon. So I'm going to use dev here. Then you want dash dash name and then put init. This is your typical name for your first migration. So we're saying what the name of the migration is and I'm naming it init. I'm going to go ahead and press enter. We'll go ahead and let this execute and then we should see some new things here in VS Code. Okay, I'm getting a message that it's going to change some things because I actually already had an employee table. You probably won't get this message as you would just be creating the table, but of course I worked through it earlier just to make sure I knew what I was doing. So I'll go ahead and say yes, and I'll let it make the changes to my employee table, and that's just fine. Now I have a migrations folder over here. You can see it's still running generate. We'll talk about everything that it's doing, but it saved those migrations that I was talking about. Now it ran generate, and after that it says it added two packages as well. So let's talk about what all this did. After we did that, it ran the migration, it created the SQL file. We don't need to look at the migration lock. There's nothing special in there. It just says don't edit this file. But here we have the date, time, and here is a migration.sql file where you can see these SQL statements that were actually executed on our employee table at Neon. So all of this happened. We created that employee table. And of course, it was noted that I was actually changing mine, but that's okay. It applied those changes for me. It created one for you. Now, after that, it also did something else. If we come back to the terminal and we see added two new packages, well, that's kind of like running an NPM install, right? That's essentially what happened because it added the Prisma client package to our project. If we look in here, here's scripts, let's look at dependencies, and now we have the Prisma client package, and we're going to be used that as well. Because it generated a tailored client API based on those models we defined back here in our schema.prisma. So now we have an API that we can reference types for as we use this model and as we use Prisma in our application. I'm going to open the terminal one more time. Let me see if I can find it. it says running generate. Yes. So anytime we change our model, we also need to run generate. And I purposely made the name unique because I'm going to change that. And I wanted you to be able to see how to do that as well. So now I'm going to remove unique from the name. We'll keep the email unique, but there might be more than one person named Dave or David or any typical name could have the John, for example. Somebody could be named John. Somebody else could be named John. So we don't want to make that one unique. So let's go ahead and apply a change to our model. And then let me show you what you have to do. Let's go ahead and open this back up. Now we want to type npx generate, or I'm sorry, npx prisma generate. And we'll go ahead and press enter now. And after that, we're going to have to run another migration just to execute those SQL commands. So we've got some more information here as well. That's fine. It did everything we wanted to with generate. And now after that, we need to go ahead and run another migration and we'll look at the SQL commands that are executed with this migration as well. So npx prisma migrate dev once again, dash dash name. Now I'll put a new name here and I'm just going to call this name change because we changed, changed the name so it's not unique anymore. I'll press enter, let it run this migration and we'll, of course, since we chose the dev option, be able to see those SQL commands that were executed on our database. So as soon as this finishes, we'll take a look at those files. Okay, it's complete. Let's close this now. Notice we should have a second migration here that I hadn't opened yet. So now, here's the first one. Look at everything that happened here as it created the employee table, it created the enum, it put a unique index on the name and the email. But the second migration, all it needed to do was drop the index that was the employee name key because we no longer needed it to be unique. So it essentially evaluated what we had previously done, and then it only executed the SQL, the SQL command that it needed to to update our data model with 
our database. So now everything's in sync between our application and our Neon Postgres database. We now have a Neon database and we've now integrated Prisma into our Nest.js project. So the next step is to create a database module and service. So I'm going to open the terminal window again and we'll use some commands we have previously learned. We'll say Nest G module database. Press enter. This should create a database folder in our source directory and there it is and inside we should have a module and we do we also need a service so let's say nest g service database and press enter and this should create our service file and of course it creates a testing file with it so now we have our new database files okay i'll close the terminal window and let's get to work on the database module so we have an import of module at the top and it's already imported our database service that's good we have our providers as a database service and then we have the export class database module that's good we also want an exports here as well so let's say exports and let's go ahead and pass in our database service that we have there and that's really all we need to add to this file now let's move on to the database service oh one other thing i want to discuss you may see this in some other tutorials where they add global up here you can do that that makes it available as long as you would import it into at least the app module you need to import your uh, database service into at least one as long as you do that then putting global here would make it available everywhere. Say if you had lots of different places you need to put that in, many connected modules, that might be easier, but it's not the best design choice. And we're in the Nest.js docs, just so you don't take my word for it on the global decorator that we'd see here, just like this at global symbol you see right there. And you can see how they use it here before a module. But as discussed, it says, making everything global is not a good design decision so it talks about when you might want to use it and when you might not we're not going to use it today but i wanted to bring it up because you might see it in some other tutorials just don't think you should use it everywhere okay back in vs code let's look at our database service file here you can see it's very minimal as we start out we've just brought in injectable as an import at the top let's also import on module init after we have that import we also need the prisma client now so let's import prisma client that's going to come from at prisma slash client okay we have both imports that we needed to add after that we just have export class database service well here we need to add to this it's going to extend so we'll use the keyword extends prisma client so we get those prisma types that we want to use and then it's going to use the keyword implements on module init and after on module init we have our curly braces let's go ahead and wrap this down with alt z so we can see that on the next line inside the curly braces we need to say async on module init which we'll call and then it added an extra async for me i can get rid of that so just async on module init and inside of that call we're going to await this dot connect and we need to call that connect so that's why this is async we await the connection to prisma and this is our database service so remember that we're using the await here to connect so later when you see our methods inside of our employees service you won't see the await there you'll see an async as we call this because we'll be calling prisma but here is where the await is as we await to connect with our database module and service now created we're now ready to start building our employees rest api now i've taken the previous lessons to talk about how to build modules how to build controllers how to build services and we did those one at a time much like we did the module and the service for our database here but what i'm going to show you now is how you can do all of that at once and create a rest api very quickly with nest.js so control back tick to open up the terminal once again we're going to type nest g resource and then what we want to name the resource and this is going to be employees i'll press enter 
and let's see what happens. It's going to ask us what we want to create here. What transport layer do you use? This is going to be a REST API. And then we'll say, or it says, would you like to generate CRUD entry points? And we will say, why? For yes, press enter. And now we can see an employees folder over here. Let's close the terminal, take a look at what's inside. You can see it created our controller, our module, and our service files. It created all of those already. We're not going to use the entities or the DTO file, although it did create them. And the reason we're not going to use those is because we'll be using the Prisma model that we already created and the types from Prisma. So I'll just delete both of those, but we do want these files for the controller, module, and service. Let's go to the module first. In the employees module, we need to go ahead and import our database module. So we will import, and after import, I shouldn't have pressed tab quite so quickly because we wanna put database module inside there. Okay, now that we have that imported, let's add it to our module here under imports, and we'll put our database module right inside, and of course, a comma afterwards. And that's all we need to change here inside of the employees module. So we've added our database module to it. Now let's look at the employees controller. And at the top of the employees controller, we deleted the DTOs. So we can delete both of those imports we had here from the DTOs that were automatically created. Now we need to import Prisma at the top. So we'll import Prisma and that comes from the Prisma client. So let's go ahead and just put from, and then we'll have at Prisma slash client. And now here you can see we have this create employee DTO that's not being used. And we won't use that anymore. Instead, we will use the Prisma dot employee create input. And now that was created based on our model by Prisma when we did the migration and of course generated everything that linked Prisma to our database. So this is using a type now and we're using this instead of a DTO that we have created in a separate file. Other than that, we're referring to this create employee DTO essentially as the new employee here that is created. And you can see that it says return this dot employee service dot create. So we're going to want to have a create method inside of our service for this as well. But before we leave the controller, let's look at what else we have. You can see it started with the create here with a post method. So our CRUD acronyms, it just starts in order with the C for CRUD and that's a post where we're creating an employee. Then read, and there's two different read methods here with the git. And one is to read all employees with the find all. The other is to find one employee. And that, of course, passes in a string. You can see it already added the unary plus here to the ID. So it's then a number that is passed in to the find one method that would be in the service. Now we have a patch. And let me press Alt Z so that wraps down as well because the update employee DTO needs to be updated as well. This is once again going to be Prisma dot employee update and then we should have an input there we go update input and that's what we want to use from prisma here instead of the update employee dto but now of course this value once again is the updated employee that is passed and you can see the unary is on the ids here as well for both the patch and the delete because the id comes in as a string and this was all created for us very quickly there's only one more change I want to make before we move on, and that is to the find all, because if you remember, we should be able to pass in a role so we only find all of the engineers or all of the interns with this as well. So let's do that by bringing in the query once again up here at the top. So that comes in from Nest.js common, and now we can use that here. So we have our find all, I'll scroll up. So the find all is right here. Now after the find all, we'll have at query inside of the parentheses. So at query and inside of there, we'll pass in a role value, not roles, just role. And after that, we'll say it's a role and it's optional. So we put a question mark and then a colon. And now our enum values, we'll have intern or an engineer or an admin. So right here it is a TypeScript union type there where it could be any one of these. But then of course, later on in our model, it is an enum. And then after we get the role, if it's possibly passed in, 
we need to send in the roll value. Now, right now, we have a squiggly here because it's not defined at all inside of our service either. So let's save these changes and we'll move on to our service. And of course, this will be corrected as we define the find all inside of the service. So now we're at the service file. We can once again delete the DTOs that are imported at the top. And now let's import Prisma. And that's once again going to come from at Prisma slash client. And then we need to import the database service that we previously created. Okay, now that we have both of those, we need to go ahead and inject that database service here into our employee service so we can use it inside. And that's going to be with a constructor. Now inside the constructor, we're going to say private, read only. Then we say database service with a lowercase d, and then we reference our database service with the uppercase d. And now after that, we just need those empty squigglies and then it will be happy and we won't have any red squigglies underneath. So our empty curly braces, I should say right there. Now after that, we can once again refer to our Prisma employee create input here. So I'll delete the DTO and say this is Prisma.employee create and then input. We see it there now. And so right now, let's not change the return action yet, but we are bringing in that input. And we're going to need to do the same down here with the updated. So let's do this while we're thinking about it. Prisma.employee updated or update input. There we go. So now we have changed out those types correctly. And now we're ready to adjust the rest of our methods. Now, another change we need to add to each one of these methods that I did mention before with the database service is that they need to be async. Now, our return will not be awaiting anything here. Remember that await is over inside of our database service. But of course, to call that, to have the database service within, which we will, we need to make these methods async here. So let's go ahead and add async to the beginning of each one so I don't forget to do it at some point on any of those. So all of these methods will then be async inside of our employee service. And now let's go ahead and reference that database service inside. So we have injected the database service here. So we'll start with this dot database service, and then we'll say employee. So this references our employee model, and then we should have access to the Prisma types. So the Prisma methods like I'll put a dot and we should have a create and we do. Now inside of the create here, we're going to say data, then we're going to pass the create employee DTO that is defined right there. So it's that value. This is the new user. If you wanted to name that new user, you could, but this follows the standard pattern calling that in create employee DTO. Okay, after that, we'll come down to the find all. Remember the find all, all had possibly a role, but only possibly, it's not required. So we'll once again define it here as optional and we'll pass those same values. It could be intern or it could be engineer or it could be admin type. So any one of those could be the role. So now we shouldn't have a problem in our controller any longer and you can see I think it's happy now with the role being there. Back in the service now, let's go ahead and create the return type or find all. So here we're going to say this dot database service dot employee. And after that, we'll say find many. And now inside of our curly braces, we can stipulate, we can say where, and now pass in the role if that role exists. And if not, it should just return everything. Underneath this, this will have a return, this dot database service, essentially the same thing, employee dot find many, and we're going to call that. So of course, now we need to logically say, right now, this is showing us with highlighting that only the top return would happen. So above, before we return that, we can say if role, now, this only happens if a role is passed, and if not, it's going to return this line here. Okay, let's scroll just a little bit, and now let's change our find one return type. So find one is also going to start off with this dot database service dot employee, and now we're going to find unique. 
And inside of this unique, we'll go ahead and say where, and then we'll pass in the ID. And when you see me put in an ID like this with a comma or a roll with a comma, it's because the key has the same name. So it beats me doing ID, ID, which you could also do, but you don't have to do it when they have the same name. So I just have ID comma, same with roll instead of a key of roll and then a value of roll. So that's why you see it that way. Now, after that, we need to go ahead and say we've found one. And well, I guess that's it for find one because it's going to return that right here. Let's move on to the next one now. And the update part here will say this.databaseService.employee. I think you see the pattern. Now we'll call update. And here we'll say where. This would be where we have that specific ID we've identified, but then what are we going to update? So now we'll have a comma, now we'll pass in the new data, which is the update employee DTO. And now finally, we're ready for the delete. And of course it's named remove right here, which is fine. That was automatically created for us. I'm going to copy the find one above, control C for that. I will come down here and change this. And all I really need to change is the find unique needs to be the delete method. So we're going to remove where the ID, of course, passed in matches. Now I might have named this delete myself, but they named it remove. And since we used that auto generation for our entire REST API, if we come back to the controller, we should see that same method here. So remove is already here in the controller as well. And everything matches up. So I think you can see how easy this was to create these service methods because we extended Prisma. And so that gave us those Prisma methods. We have our database service, then we reference our model, and then we had the Prisma methods. They're available with dot notation. Okay, we're ready to start up our REST API and check out a few endpoints. So let's go to control back tick, back to the terminal window. Now we can type npm run start colon dev, and this should start our REST API. And we can see everything's running. I'll have to scroll back up in the terminal, see if it tells us exactly where it's running, and no, it didn't. But of course, we can reference that also if we look at our main TS. We'll close this out. See, we're listing on port 3000. Let's create a new request with Thunder Client here. So I'm going to click New Request, and at the top, I'll be able to type localhost, and then it should be port 3000 slash employees, no slash at the end though, no space. Let's just say slash employees and send our request. And I may have an issue here with the HTTPS. It probably should just be HTTP in dev mode. Let's go ahead and send that. Yep, everything looks good. And we don't have any employees yet, but we do know our server is working. We just have an empty array and that's fine for now. So let's go ahead and go to the post request to complete a request and create a new user. So we need to go to the body here. And for the body, if you remember, we needed to add a name. So here we'll say Dave. And after that, we need an email. Here we'll say Dave at DaveGray.codes. And finally, we can say a role. And here I'm going to make Dave an admin. And we don't want that extra comma there when we send a request. But there is the full body of our request. It's going to be a post request to the employees API. Let's go ahead and send this. And the information we get back says, yes, this was created. Here is Dave's ID. Here's that created at timestamp. And here is the updated at timestamp. So if we send another like request with an update, then of course we might get a different updated at value as well. But let's go ahead and create a second user first here. Let's say Ken, let me start out with a capital K, and we'll give him Ken at DaveGray.codes, and Ken is an intern. So let's send this. And now Ken has been created as well. So we've got a couple of employees in the database now. So now after that, we can issue our get request again to employees to get all. And let's see if we get both back. Yes, here's an array of JSON data. Here's the first employee. Here is the second. So we've got both of those. Now let's just get one. If you remember, we can do that by passing in an ID at the very end of the URL. So pin is ID two. Let's see if we can get that with our find 
unique request here. And yep, we just got kin return. So that worked as well. Now after that, let's update one. So we do that with a patch request, bring this back down. And what we wanna do is say update number two here. That's fine. Let's promote kin to an engineer. And let's go ahead and send this information now. And let's see what we've got. We scroll up here. We've got this information now. Ken has been promoted to an engineer. Notice the updated at time is now different than the created at because it went ahead and gave the new timestamp to when the record was updated. Now let's go ahead and do a delete. We'll go ahead and delete Ken. He's decided to leave the company now. And we're sending that to ID number two. So that should delete Ken and we'll send. We get his information back. But now when we request all users, we'll just say get, we'll get rid of the ID number at the end, send this, the only user left is Dave. So that worked as well. Now let's go ahead and post maybe a third employee. So give some more information here and we'll come in here instead of Ken, let's go with, uh, let's say Gina. Let's say Gina is at davegray.codes and she's an engineer as well. Send this information. New uh, user is created or new employee is created. And now if we go back and get all one more time here, we should get both Dave and Gina as employees. So everything is working as expected, all of those endpoints. And you can see how easy this was all to pull together with type safety by extending those Prisma types and we could access those methods. It all works very smooth and it created our Neon database, which we haven't even had to go back to the website to modify or do anything with. Let me go back there now and we'll look at our Neon database here so we can look at tables inside of this window and let's see what we've got for tables pulls up our employee table and we can see inside of the employee table here at neon we've got dave and gina as we entered them into our database very easy very smooth all type safe all the way through i really like this developer experience and we created a complete REST API. But we're not quite finished with our Nest.js series yet. We'll be back to add a few extras to our REST API in the next lesson. Today we will add cores, rate limiting, server logs, and an exception filter for improved error reporting, especially with Prisma that we introduced in the last lesson. Now I've had requests to add microservices and authentication to this series, but I think those topics both deserve their own mini series of videos. So today will be the last video lesson of this Nest.js for Beginners series, and we will have completed creating a REST API that you can deploy as you would any Node.js application. We're starting in the docs today and we're looking at the global prefix and as you see they attach it directly to the app that is set in the main.ts file that we have and it adds a global prefix. Now we were previously requesting uh, things at the employees endpoint but now we really want to attach API because most APIs use that and that of course says where our API is. So we want to go slash API slash employees or to whatever other resources we would create. And we can attach API to all of those resources if we put a global prefix. So let's go back to VS Code and add that first. We're back in VS Code. I have the source directory open here in the file tree. I'm going to go to the main.ts file. You can see we have our app right here and then we await and have app.listen on port 3000. But in between those, we can actually attach our set global prefix. So let's say app dot set global prefix. Now inside of here, all we need to do is put API. It will handle the slashes in between each level for us. And now we're back in the docs and we're looking at cores. Core stands for cross origin resource sharing. It's very important when you're setting up a REST API. And if you've worked on the front end at all, you may have received a response from a request that said the cores header did not exist. So you know it's probably important that we configure cores so people that are not on our domain at another origin, so cross origin, can actually request some data from our API. Now we can keep a list of allowed origins and only let those domains access what we have at our domain. 
But if you just set it up like this, where they show enable cores, essentially you're opening it up for everyone. So if we wanted to have a public REST API, we could just say app.enable cores, and that would open it up for everyone. However, cores does take an optional configuration object argument, and it's no different than the typical package we would use if we created a REST API with just Node.js and Express. And in fact, we used that exact configuration in my Node.js for Beginners course, and there's a link to that in the GitHub repo for this series because it was a recommended prerequisite. Now let's go ahead and quickly look at that configuration. I'm not going to use it today, but I'm in my GitHub repo for that Node.js course, and we can see this configuration right here. It defines origin inside of an object, and it has a function in here. And that's all explained in that other video. I'm not going to go back through it, but notice it's using allowed origins that are imported, and you can see in the allowed origins file, that I just put in, say, yoursite.com, whatever your domain would be, and then typically what we would have, at least what we had at the time, when we were running anything on our local host in dev mode. So there were those options as well. But anyway, you can get all of this in my Node.js course, and that is linked in the readme for this Nest JS series as a prerequisite. So now let's go back to VS Code and enable cores so we can at least have a public API and everyone can request our resources. Okay, we're back in VS Code, right where we had the set global prefix. Let's go ahead and add another line right before that, and let's say app dot enable cores. And of course we need the parentheses to call that into action. And there we have now configured cores, very easy in Nest.js. But again, I emphasize this is opening it up to everyone. So cross origin requests are allowed. You would need to add that configuration object if you wanted to limit who could access the resources through cores. And speaking of limiting, we are now discussing rate limiting. Here in the docs, you can see we need to add another dependency as we add rate limiting. It says npm i, we don't need the dash dash save, that happens automatically anymore. But then at nestjs slash throttler. So let's go back to VS Code, we'll add this in and I'll show you how to implement it. Back in VS Code, let's open up a terminal window. I'm going to paste in what we talked about, npm i at nest.js slash throttler. Let's go ahead and add this as a dependency to our REST API project here in nest.js. It shouldn't take too long. And then we'll go ahead and apply it to the uh, project. And we're not going to do that in the main TS. We're actually going to do that here in the app.module.ts file. So let's start with the imports we need at the top. So we're going to import Rotler, and then module, and then we also need Rotler, I spell that right, a strange word actually, Throttler guard, there we go, from Nest.js Throttler. We need one more import, so we're also going to import, now this is all caps, so app underscore guard, and that is going to come from at nestjs slash four. There we go. Let's go ahead and save those changes. Now we need to apply that to our module underneath. The imports are getting a little long. I'll scroll up here and let's put each one of these on a different line. So we had started out with a user's module example in the earlier lessons. Then we added the database module and the employees module. That's all good. Now we need to add the throttler module here. So I'll put one more comma after that and on a new line, let's have a line in between. There we go. Throttler module. I seem to have a hard time typing that one. For root. Now inside of the parentheses, we need to start an array and then an object. Now there's two values here, TTL, so time to live. I'm going to set that at 60,000, these are milliseconds again. And then I'm going to set this really low so you can see what happens when we exceed the limit. So I'm going to set this limit to three. And if there's any confusion here, 60,000 would be one minute. So only three requests in one minute, that's super low. I can easily exceed that. 1,000 milliseconds would be one second. But we're not quite finished because we also need to do something here with the provider. So after the app service, let's put a comma, and now let's start an object. And now inside of this object, we're going to say, I need lowercase, provide, and this is where we'll use the app guard that we imported. 
After that, we'll say use class, and this is where we'll put the throttler guard that we imported. And now that should apply the throttler module, essentially rate limiting our entire application. Now we will look at how to override this on a pre module basis or actually also a pre-route basis. So you can drill down to each thing and override the default that you have set or defaults as we'll soon see. But let's go ahead and look at what error this gives. And to do that, we need to go ahead and start up npm run start colon dev and we'll get our REST API going. And then we need to make a request you are now slash API slash employees endpoint. I'm going to use my built-in Thunder Client extension as I have in this series. You could use whatever you want to, whether it's Postman or some other piece of software that you use to send requests. And now you can see here, let's see, I've got a fake role here of pasta. Let's remove that. And now we've got slash API slash employees. Also, since we're in a dev environment, make sure it's just HTTP and not HTTPS. I'm going to send a request. It's good, that's fine. We got all the employees, let me send it again. And again, we've hit our limit of three. I send number four, we get a status code 429, throttler exception, too many requests. That's exactly what we wanted. We have limited the amount of requests any one client could make from our API. Again, I set that way low. Let's go back and look at some other settings that we can put in. Back to the app.module.ts file. We'll look at the file tree over here again. Now, instead of just this one setting, we can actually put in some named settings. So let's do that. We start with this object here. Let's go ahead and give it a name and let's call this one short. Now for our time to live, let's make this one second. And let's say we want no more than three requests in any one second. That's a little bit more realistic from the same client. Again, not in total from everyone. Now, besides that, we can add another object here with another name. So I could just copy this object again, and then we could change some values. So I'll paste that in here. Let's call this one long. Now you could have more than two if you wanted. Now for long, I'll put this back to one minute. And let's say we want no more than 100 requests in one minute. So two different values. Now they both apply also. So no more than three requests in one second and no more than 100 requests in any one minute duration. I'm not sure I could click fast enough to show this example, but I'll leave this in the code just so you have it here. Now let's look at how we can override this inside of our employees resource. Let's open up the employees directory and go to the employees controller. Here we need to import skip throttle if we're going to use it and throttle if we're going to use it. So I'll import both throttle and skip throttle. And those are going to come from at nestjs slash throttler. There we go. Now that we have both, if we wanted to skip the throttler, essentially the rate limiting for this entire resource, this entire controller, we could just say at skip throttle and call it right here at the top above the controller. And that would skip it for everything inside this controller. So that's one possibility. Another is let's say we wanted to skip it for most everything but we wanted to apply it to our get all, where we get all the employees here, or find all method under our get route. And here we would put another skip throttle, but now inside we pass an object and we would have default, and here we would say false, it accepts a Boolean value. So the default is actually usually true. So when you just say skip throttle and call it, it's going to skip everything after it. But now if we put this decorator for skip throttle just above this get request to find all the employees, then it's going to go ahead and rate limit this particular get request. So that's a nice addition besides the control we have at essentially the global level for our application. But now let's say we wanted to override the defaults for a different route. Of course, you could do this for the entire class as well here at the top of the controller. But let's just do it here for our find one route that's also a get request. So above this, I'm going to put throttler. 
Now inside of here, we pass an object as well. Now previously, we had some other uh, names already. We had short and we had long instead of just default. So we could override that and we could say short. Here we could have an object. You have to have the same values. So time to live, let's say in, what, what was that? That was like, uh, I think it was in one second. We said no more than three requests. Let me quickly look at that object once again. So yeah, limit is the next one. So here we have the name, but it's different. We don't have name short. We just have short here with an object. So now we say limit. And let's say we're going to limit this to one request because I might be able to actually exceed that. And I seem to have a TypeScript issue here. I don't think I did this right. Throttler doesn't seem right. Yes, I imported throttle, not throttler. So I need to remove the R there. And now we should be okay. So, oh, we need the decorator in front of it as well. So I totally messed it up. I added an extra character here and I left the decorator off the back. So here we have at throttle It is a decorator. Now we have our named uh, rate limiting that we previously defined in app module of short. And we're overriding that. We're still saying one second, but now we're saying a limit of three. You can do that. If you don't have any named, if you set it up like I did, in the very beginning, before we had any of these name settings, you can use default here and you can override your default as well. So either one works. We'll call this short. Let's go ahead and save this change. Now I want to make a request again to API slash employees and then put an ID after it. And I want to try to make more than one request in one second. Let me see if I can do that. So back here. In Thunder Client, we had too many requests before, but now we should be okay for the first one. I'm going to request employee with an ID of one. And let's make sure we can get that data. Yep, that's me there. So, okay, now I'm going to request it twice in one second if I can. Yep, we've got a 429 because we were able to override that short setting on that one specific route in the controller by passing the at throttle decorator once again after I corrected myself, overriding that short value that we set in the module here with the name of short. Now you don't have to do that, but it's nice to have that option. And now you know how to add rate limiting at the full global app level as well as to any controller and also to any given route. Override any of those you want to or skip any of the rate limiting you want to anywhere you want to. We're back in the docs and looking at logger under techniques for logging in the Nest.js docs. Now I wanna say right up front that many deployed applications make use of other logging packages like Winston, but we're going to quickly look at what is built into Nest.js and we're going to use it today as we create an error exception handler that grabs all of the errors, including those that we might get as validation errors from Prisma. And so we'll throw that together fairly quickly and it just gives you another option in your skills. So let's start by looking at the basic customization and you can see we're going to bring in logger here and we could just set it to false so we're actually not logging anything. And as you might guess, you could also log everything. So after that, we want to look at what else we could set logger to if it's not false. And here we can give it an array and we can choose several things, log, fatal, error, warn, debug, and verbose. We can choose any of those we want. And of course, every time we make a save and make changes in our dev mode, we're going to see the Nest.js server reboot with those changes. You'll see a lot of log messages as everything starts up. We're going to move right on to a custom implementation. Now, what you can do with the custom implementation is essentially override the common logger service that is built into Nest.js. So you can see the class here and it shows you the methods in the class. You've got log, fatal, error, warn, and so on. You could overwrite all of these. We're not going to do that. Most of these are fine just the way they are. And we might not want all of those, but of course you could. And the code is right here in the docs to grab the skeleton of this class and put your logic in here. You might even be writing to a text file when you log these errors as well as sending them to the console in the server. So now after we scroll down here, it's going to talk just a little bit more about what we can do. And one of those things is to extend the built-in logger. That's something I'm more interested in doing. So now we could import console logger 
And then we could create a class called mylogger that extends console logger. And then we could put in any method that we want to kind of piggyback on here. So just like the error handler, and then we call super.error. So it goes ahead and does what it normally would have done with console logger back in the built-in logger configuration up here in the logger service. So if we implement this, we might have something we want to use. Let's go ahead and do that in VS Code. We're back in VS Code. I'm going to press Control C here in the terminal to stop our server. Also go to the file tree over here so we can see what's going on. We've got our employees. Here is the app module. And now in the terminal, I'm going to type nest g module my dash logger. And we're going to create a new module and we should see a new folder over here named my logger that has that module in it. It doesn't have everything we need by any means, but it's a good start. We're also going to need to create a provider, so a service, nest g service my dash logger. And now it should create the extra files we expect with a service, and there they are. And not much in here yet either. So let's create the service first, and then we'll bring it back into the module. Now this is going to be as custom as you want it to be. So you don't necessarily have to copy mine. You'll have mine finished in the completed source code for this lesson. But the main thing is to get the concept of how you put this together. So after we export the class, we want to say extends console logger, which we haven't imported yet. I was hoping it would just automatically at the top, but it's not gonna happen. So I'll say import console. Oh, we already have injectable up there at the top. So let's just go ahead and add console logger right here in this line, console logger. So it comes from the same nest.js common. So we've extended console logger. Now inside of this class, we can go ahead and add whatever method that we want to kind of piggyback on. So it's one that already exists in console logger, but we want to add a little bit more to it. In this case, I'll work with the most common ones, just log and error. So we'll start with log. Now, if we mouse over, let's see if TypeScript helps us at all. It says it implicitly has any here. So it's not helping us a whole lot, but I do know what error take or what log takes in. It's going to have a message and it's typically defined as any here and then context. And let's say this is optional and it's a string. Now you could look back in that logger service to see what these actually are because you want to match these up. So now I'm going to combine both of these and we'll say const entry because this is going to be a log entry into a text file log that I keep. So we would have a template literal here and I'm going to start with the context going to separate them with a tab, which is a backslash with a lowercase t, and then I'm going to put the message. So I want a tab delimited log text file that could be imported into an Excel spreadsheet if that's what I wanted to do. So after that, here I'm going to call a method that's actually going to record that entry into that text file, but we haven't written that method yet. So here we want super.log and let's look at what log wants here. And this is possibly what we need to see. No, this is not where I saw it. Oh, yes, it is. There we go. Console logger dot log message any context is optional and it's a string. So you want to match that when you are taking in here with log. That's essentially what you want. So now that we have that, we just pass in the message and the context here to the super.log. Now, of course, we're not using entry yet, but we will as we write to a text file. Let's do one more of these. Let's start with error. And now we don't know what error takes in yet either. So let's do this the way that would make sense. And that was if you were to call super and now also have error here. And then let's look at what error wants here. And we see it up above message any stack or context string. And I think you could just copy it right out of here. You sure can with control C. We can put that in there. That's what should be called with the error. And I totally wasn't thinking because I put it in the wrong spot. It shouldn't go in there. Even though we read it from there, it should go in up here. And that's why it should match. Here's where you're actually calling it. So it wants the message and it also wants the stack or context, and now it's going to be happy as well. Anything else you want to do can come before that. Once again, I just want to define that same entry with the context and the message, and we would eventually write to an error log here if we wanted to as well. Actually, it's not context, 
its stack or context that we would have right there. So just a little different that you have to customize. And now whatever would normally happen inside of the error could be here. And I don't really think we need to have those curly braces because I didn't with log either. We just call it with super dot error. And that should be good. So if we wanted to write to our text file, it would be in between both of these. And now I'm going to add some Node.js code that was very similar to what I had in my Node.js for Beginners series. So I'm not going to go over every little bit of it with you, but it's just about creating a log file directory and writing or appending to that log file if it exists and if not creating it. So we've got a few imports up here with the file system promises from the file system promises and path. After that, I'm just going to paste in my function that is called log to file here. It'll actually be a method inside of my logger service is what this is called. And we could shorten that to my logger, but my logger service is just fine. And I put that in so I can wrap that down with Alt Z quickly show you what I'm doing. It's an async method that accepts that entry that we are creating. I'm adding to that here with a formatted entry that also brings in the current date, and then it ends it with a new line character, so each entry is on a new line. What happens is it checks to see if that directory logs exists. If it does exist, then it, or if it doesn't exist, actually it goes ahead and makes the directory. If it does exist, it just appends to the file, and the file is going to be called my log file. And of course, you could actually add another param here to this, and you could write to different files if you wanted to pass in the file name all the time. And this is in a try catch block as well. So that's what we're doing. Now let's go ahead and call that inside of the methods here, because this is the whole reason we added this. We extended the console logger so we could add a little functionality. Well, our added functionality is to write to these files. So inside of our log here, we want to say this dot log to file, which is our method. And then we want to pass in the entry we defined. And I'm going to do the same thing. Copy that without making a mistake and do the same thing here inside of our error method as well. And again, if I went too fast on this function, first of all, I'm going to recommend my Node.js course because if you're learning Nest.js, you need to already know how to do some of the basic things with files in Node.js because that's lying underneath Nest.js. So you should go back and of course, look at my Node.js for beginners course. And if not, this is going to be in the finished source code for this video. And now we have just a little bit to do inside of our my-logger.module file. So here we have my logger service imported already. That's good. Providers, my logger service. Now we also need an exports here. So let's say exports. And inside of this would be my logger service as well. And now at the bottom, we have my logger module. And really, that is all that's needed for this file. So now if you wanted to use this globally, it's not too hard to do. I'm not going to end up doing that today, but I'll quickly show you how to do it. After we created our module, it was automatically already imported into the app.module.ts. And we see that was created for us here. It brought it in at the top as well. So we should see that import and you should see it in the app module. That's fine, but that's not the only thing we need. We need to go to the main.ts file. So if we're going to use this, we've got the app module here inside of the nest factory.create method. Then we want to put in a comma and have an object. And this is where we would set those other settings that we briefly looked at, like logger false, or we would pass in an array and say the different types of logging we wanted, like verbose. But here, instead of any of those, we would go ahead and put buffer logs. And now here would say true. And this is because this is outside of any module and you've got to give just a little buffer to make sure that that service has been instantiated. So that's what buffer logs is all about. Now there's one more thing you have to do after that. And that would be to say app dot use logger. Now we pass in app dot get. And here we would say my logger service. And let's see, yes, it imported that automatically at the top for it. Now that is all you need to use that logger service globally. So now it would be active everywhere. And that's fine. It could get full of a lot of those startup logs as we would restart. Of course, you wouldn't normally restart your server nearly as much 
as you do in dev mode. But there it is all applied globally. However, I don't want to use that today, so I'm going to remove it. You just want to remember how to do it here. So I'm going to go ahead and take it out of here, and I don't want it with the app module up here either. So I'll go ahead, get rid of that configuration, and remove the import as well. We're going to use it individually on a class-by-class -class basis as we want to apply it to any given resource. So now to demonstrate, I'll just give one example inside of employees and you can apply it to other places if you want to. The main thing is that you understand the concept of how to create it. So I'm in the employees controller and I'm going to go ahead and need to import that service. So inside of here, we'll say import logger service or my logger service. I think it's my logger service. There we go. And now that we've imported that, we can go right underneath the constructor here and say private read only logger. Let's set this equal to a new my logger service. And now inside of here, we're in the employees controller and I want to pass in a context. And so this is going to be the employees controller dot name. So we're passing in the name of the controller. Now we have a context that will be logged with those log messages so we know where whatever happened happened. So let's go down to this find all method that we have under our git route and let's log something. So now that we have this, let's say this dot logger dot log. And now we can pass in any message we want to here. It's ready to go ahead and record. And one other thing that I want to do is actually get the IP address of whoever makes this request. And we can do that as well with another decorator from Next.js. We'll need to bring that into our function also. So up here after our query, I'll press Alt-Z so it'll probably wrap down. Let's also bring in IP with a capital I lowercase p. So now we have the IP decorator back in this git route for find all. And let's start before the query because it can't be optional. Uh, we can't have something that's required after an optional param. So we need to put the IP first, it's going to be required. So here we have IP and we call it. Now we'll say IP is going to be a string. So now we have the IP address as well and I'd like to record that. So let's first put in a message here that is a template literal request for all employees. And now after this, I'll put in a slash T for a tab again, because I want to keep my file tab delimited. Again, this is a roll your own, use something like Winston or something else, you probably wouldn't have to do that. Now I can pass in that IP value. So the last value should be the IP address. And so we're logging that and it should go into our text file. And that's important if we're having any problem with any specific uh, user requesting from a specific IP address, we're going to be able to record that now as well. Now, what about logging errors? Well, before we do that, we wanna create our exception filter that's going to grab all the errors that happen everywhere so we can get an accurate record of everything that's going on in our application. Let's go back to the docs. We're back in the Nest.js docs and we're looking at exception filters now. And this is under the overview with exception filters. Now, as it says here, you may want full control over the exceptions layer. Well, we definitely want some control. They give us several code snippets here. Here is a common filter that you could just copy this code from http-exception.filter.ts and create that file and you could use that. We're going to do something a little bit different, but I took some code from here, so you wanna be able to know what this is doing, understand how this is working. You can see it's getting these different values. CTX stands for context, by the way. Here's a response, here's a request. Notice they're bringing in request and response from Express, which is under the hood, and then we're getting the status as well. It gets a little more complicated if the type of exception is not just an HTTP exception, but possibly any type of exception. And they've got a code example for that as well, where we're looking at all exceptions. And that's more or less what I wanna create here. So I'm scrolling down, I know it's going to be down here soon, and they're showing how to apply some of that. Catch everything. So this is similar, but a little different. Notice the catch here does not have that HTTP passed in at all now, it's empty. And this is going to catch everything and they're calling this class all exceptions filter. 
Now, I know if you just copy this code, it's going to have an issue or two. But what you need to look out for, what you will identify as the problem, is this exception before you can do anything like get the status of the exception that we saw in that previous code example and they use here too, you need to make sure exception is an instance of HTTP exception, and then it will have get status available. If not, they're going ahead and providing something else here, the internal server error, which would be a number, I believe, like 500 you would typically see with that. Now, the response body is created after that, and they're sending a response. I'm going to show you my code. They give you most all of the code here. My code just pulls it together. We're back in VS Code, and we want to create our new file at the same level as our main TS file here inside of the source directory. So let's create a new file and we'll call this all-exceptions.filter.ts, just like they did in the docs. Now we've got a few things to import here at the top. So let's go ahead and start with that. We will import catch and that comes from nest.js common. Now we need several other things besides just catch. We also need comma then arguments host HTTP status and HTTP exception. Okay, I'm going to press Alt Z so that wraps down to the next line. Now we know we're finished with that line. Let's go ahead and import the base exception filter because we're going to extend that. Now we also need to import request and response. That's going to come from Express as we noted in that previous example as well. Once we've got those, we need to import our logger service too, because we want to write to our logs. So we're going to import my logger service. There it is. And after we have that, let's go ahead and import the Prisma client validation error. Now Prisma has several different errors. I'm just going to show you an example of this one. I'll show you where to find the others as well. Okay, I need a response type. So I'm just going to put this in here from my previous code. I can quickly go over it. I've just got my response object type has a status code that's a number, timestamp that's a string, a path that's a string, and a response that can be a string or object. Now what this is, is formatting essentially the model for the way we want to handle our errors. And so this gives us control over our application and will always be receiving errors with this information filled out. So it gives us a little bit more control than just a random error that we might have otherwise. Okay, let's scroll for some room. We need to start off with the catch decorator that we imported. So we'll call that. Then we want to export class all exceptions filter. And this is going to extend, so extends the base exception filter. Once we've done that, we need private, read only, and let's bring in our logger. And we've done this before. We'll set it equal to a new my logger service. We need to pass in now the all exceptions filter, and then of course get the name. So that gives it the context, which we did earlier for our logger too. Now we can start our catch, which will have an exception that is unknown. And of course, you can look in the docs to confirm this. And then we have host, and this is going to be the arguments host. So yes, I got that right out of the docs. So now let's bring in some values similar to what we saw in the example in the docs as well. Now if I save, we might get a better format. Nope, I need to do that. So I'm going to tab that over. There we go. So what we've got here is the context, once again, response and request. Those are the examples we saw in the docs. Now here's my initial response object, and I'm setting up the timestamp right away to an ISO string. I'm also setting this status code to 200, unless we run into an error or something else where we're going to overwrite that status code. And then, of course, we're going to have the response as well. So now in the interest of saving a little bit of time, I'm going to paste in the if and then else if statement, and we'll look at what it does. And I need control V. There we go. I'll also need to format this. I think I turned off my format on save. So I'll just tab this over. Looks right now. So what I'm doing 
And this is to help TypeScript help me as well, because the exception isn't always the same type, so it doesn't always have the same methods. So we need to check to see if the exception is an instance of the HTTP exception. Then we can use the get status and get response methods to set the status code for our response object as well as the response. But for example, if it's the Prisma client validation error, well then we want a 422 response and I want to get that message and it's a message that's broken into several lines. I'm actually using replace all here to replace the line breaks. So we get all of that in one line and it will write neatly to our logs as well as send the proper status code. And I do just want to take a second to acknowledge that I put 200 here as the default. We're already in the all exceptions filter. Maybe I should go ahead and make that a 500 because we know we shouldn't be here without an exception. That is the catch all internal server error that you would expect a status code for. That could be our default right here that we're getting from the HTTP status dot internal server error as well. And our default response of internal server error. Okay, do I have an extra curly brace? I'm wondering. Nope, that is our catch right there, and that's green. So let me tab all of this in to get it on the right level. And now that looks correct to my eyes. After that, we need to go ahead and send our response. So let's go ahead and type response that we defined above. And now on the next line, let's go ahead and say status. And here for status, we can just reference our object where we already set the value. So my response object dot status code, and that is what we want to send for the status. Then let's send a JSON object for the message, or JSON string, I should say. My response object is what we're going to pass inside and send all of those values. Now we haven't logged anything yet, but we did bring in the logger. So we'll say this dot logger. This is where we can call the error method. And now we can pass in the exception and you know what, since we already have that message, let me go ahead and look at that one more time here. Oh yeah, and the replace all on it. What we actually want to do is not just pass in the exception, we want to pass in the my response object dot response that's already formatted for however or whatever type of error we receive. So let's pass that in to fulfill that exception. Now this also needs a host passed in if we look at what we've got here, so we've got message, any, stack, or context string. No, nope. so the host defined, let me take a look. Oh, and I know the error. This shouldn't be going to my logger here. This goes in the next line. So I was looking one ahead. What I do want to send is the context here. This is the all exceptions dot filter dot name one more time. Now on the very next line where I was looking one line off, that certainly happens to me as well as probably everyone else every now and then, I want to send in the exception and the host with the super. Now this of course is passing on what should be happening already because we extended the base exception filter. So now we just allow it to carry out what it would have been carrying out. And that completes our all exceptions filter. Now after that, we still need to pull it in and apply it to our application. So let's go to the main.ts file. At the top of our file, besides the nest factory, we also need to bring in HTTP adapter host from the nest.js core. And then we need to bring in our all exceptions filter. So here we'll import all exceptions filter. Now we're finished with the imports. We need to add two more lines to our application here. So I'm going to say const, and now we destructure the HTTP adapter. This is going to come from app.get, and now we pass in the HTTP adapter host. And now on the next line, I'm wondering what's wrong here. We have app.get, and we didn't set it equal. We need an equal sign there. I'm creating a typo or two. Long tutorial. Okay, after HTTP adapter, we need app dot use global filters. And now inside of this use global filters, we'll create a new all exceptions filter and we pass in the HTTP adapter that it expects to receive. That completes everything we need. Now we should have applied this all exceptions filter that will grab all of the errors. And of course, we need to go ahead and try it out and make sure we're logging the errors we expect to log. We'll go control backtick to open up the terminal. npm run start colon dev. 
and we'll get this up and running. We'll make a couple of requests and see if we can create some errors. And it looks like we've got an error, which isn't surprising as many typos as I've been making. Let's see what's going on. Oh, we didn't connect to Neon properly. Let's go ahead and try to restart this one more time. That can happen every now and then too. Let's go ahead and NPM run dev. Let's see if it starts up correctly now. And yes, everything is started and it looks good. Let's go to Thunder Client where we can make some requests and let's just request all employees. I'll scroll this down. We'll bring this down a little bit. Let's make sure it works. And yes, we got all the employees, so that's good. Let's make several rapid requests now. So two, three, four, too many requests. And here is the form or the format that we wanted for our errors. So we can see status code 429. We have the timestamp we wanted. We can see the path that was requested and too many requests. So that worked as expected. Okay, now let's try this one more time. And I may have to wait depending on what we exceeded. Let's set our role. Let's set it equal to admin and see if we get a successful request. Yes, we have the admin employees, so that's good. Now, what if we set this to something like you just saw there, like pasta? Let's see what happens. That's not a role. Ah, now we got our 422 because that was a Prisma validation error. So you can see the path that was requested, and we have this long message. As a matter of fact, it breaks down to several lines, even though we made it return on one line because it's long, but when we get to the end of it, at least Prisma gives us something that we can definitely understand. Invalid value for argument role, expected role. So pasta is not a valid value for that. So it says invalid right here at the beginning as well, but we can figure out what we want from those messages. So we've got the 422 that we expected as well. Everything worked well there as far as what we wanted in a response. Let's look at the file tree now and see if we have a logs directory. And we do, and we have a my log file. Let's check this out. So we had a request for all employees. Now something came in undefined here, which I believe that's the context. We might wanna see if we did something wrong there, but yes, the context with all exceptions filter is good here. So that's important. Let's go ahead and see if everything else came in as expected. Yep, the too many requests problem. That's fine. So everything's recording. We just have an undefined value here that should be the context for this request. We want to find out what's happening there. Also, I want to highlight this. If we pull up Control F, now we're searching for something. Let's backspace over this. Let's press the dot asterisk so we know we're using regex and we can search for that uh, backslash T, uh, lowercase t is what we actually want here. And there we go. So now you can see all of the tabs in this file. It's all tab delimited. It doesn't look like they're the same spaces, that, but they are. So this would import correctly into a spreadsheet or something if you were making a text log file. So that's what we wanted as well. Let's take a quick look at that employees controller just to see why we're not getting the context that we expect to get. So here is this.logger.log request for all employees. That looks fine. Let's come up to the top here. Private read-only logger, new my logger service, and we're passing in the context here as well. This tells me I might have something wrong in the log method itself for my logger. Let's go back and look at that. We're in the my logger service now, and let's take a look at what we're passing in when we log something here. And I think I see my issue. I'm only passing in a message to the log and it actually needs the context passed in as well. So let's go back to that employees controller now and let's verify that. So when we scroll down here and find where we're logging, we're only passing in the message. Let's go ahead and pass in that context. So the context was employees controller dot name. And now that should not be undefined in our log if we go ahead and have another issue. So let's do that. We've still got our server running. Go to our endpoints over here. Send another request for the roll pasta. We send that in, it's unprocessable, that's fine. But we did make a request, right? No, this was the other issue. So what we wanna do maybe is make a get all request 
or maybe it actually logged both. I think that's what's happening because it's logging when we're making the get all request route, but it's also catching the validation error. So let's see what we've got. And now if we come down here, that is exactly what's happening. So before we had undefined and all exceptions filter with the invalid, but here we now have the employees controller and the all exceptions filter. So we're getting the context of each. So I just missed passing in that context with the log statement inside of the employees controller. We're in the Prisma docs now. I promised I would talk about all of the different Prisma errors and you see them here on the right under the error message reference. You could look for all of these inside of that if else if statement and handle them accordingly to each error. So we talked about the validation error, but you could get other Prisma client errors as well, like possibly not connecting to the database, for example, things like that that could be handled here also. And finally, I want to highlight one package we did not use because it's not built into Nest.js, but it is a commonly used package from a third party here called Nest.js dash Prisma. And they just make the implementation when you're using Prisma fairly easy to do. And so they've added some extra nice things. We've got logging middleware and an exception filter here too, that you could also look at how to do these same things with. I just wanted to cover what was built into Nest.js. And with that, we have completed a full REST API in Nest.js. Now you should customize this, make it your own, especially when it comes to the data. I just gave examples, but this series should have been a good starting point for anyone getting started with Nest.js. Not beginners to programming, but again, beginners to working with the Nest.js framework that is built on top of Node.js and Express. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you, and thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.